you're listening to the Pentaract Poetry Podcast, hosted by Anthony Etherin. Welcome to episode 23 of the Pentaract Podcast. Clara and I are joined this time by Laurie Wyke and Mark Saltlight to discuss the history, present and future of palindromes. We began by asking Laurie and Mark to introduce themselves. I'm Laurie Wyke and uh, I... Well, I, I play with sounds and I play with letters. I think that's probably a, a good way of describing what I do. I'm a musician. I, I play a bassoon with the Utah Symphony and I, I teach at the University of Utah. And I've been writing palindromes for maybe about eight years now, um, at least obsessively. And yeah, that's my very brief introduction. And Mark. Yeah, uh, my name is Mark Saltvite. I'm the editor of the Palindromist magazine, uh, which I started around, I don't know, 1993 or something like that, uh, a couple years after I started obsessively writing palindromes. Uh, I have an origin story, which I'll save for later. Uh, I also work as a stand-up comedian, and uh, I'm working at a library right now part-time to pay the bills, and uh, I'm a bit of a writer, too. American football, which I know. Yeah, nothing. well, I used I'm now retired from American football. That that was one of those quirky things. Uh, uh, philosophically, I'm a Taoist and I, I kind of, you know, I do kind of follow opportunities, whatever they pop up in front of me. So I kind of accidentally became an, a sports writer in my 50s. <laughs> Around 2013, I, I just sort of started uh, obsessively following this football team, the Oregon Ducks, where my wife was in and daughters were all attending school there, uh, daughters from a previous marriage. And uh, they had this amazing coach, exciting new formations, really fast paced, whatever. And then he got hired to the National Football League and everyone was scared to write a book about him because he refused to do interviews. And I'm, you know, a sort of mostly unemployed writer at that time. I'm like, well, I could write a book about him. I've been staring at his team for months. And so I just did and like pounded it out in a month and uh, got picked up, sold out the first printing and uh, a bigger publisher in New York picked it up. And so that's next six years, I'm a sports writer. And that, that kind of just read its course the other day. I published my third book there, uh, this time about the San Francisco 49ers who I had followed to cover. And then I got laid off, and uh, I'm like, all right, that's good. That's I'm done. <laughs> that was fun while it lasted, but it's not really my passion. So. Well, that's quite a nice way of going through life. But then you have got one consistent passion, so let's talk about that. Uh, my wife? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Not an idiot. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, my lovely daughters. Um, no, but palindromes are... are uh, you know, I, I started, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in palindromes, like, I don't know about in, in the UK or other countries, but in the United States, palindromes are very t often taught to school kids in the third, fourth, or fifth grades, which is age eight to 10, say, roughly. And, and they're just taught by teachers as a way to interest kids in language and playing with words and looking at the structure of it. It's very hard to get anyone interested in diagramming a sentence, but then this kind of gives you a reason to care about that sort of thing. And I was really obsessed for two weeks, <laughs> I think, with my brothers. And we sat around trying to write palindromes, and we were terrible. And the best we ever came up with was radar, kayak, radar. Uh, and it was pretty weak, but it works. And then uh, we thought we were going to be the most famous naughty boys in the world because we came up with a dirty palindrome, which was eat poop tea. And then one of us noticed, oh, it doesn't work. That would be eat poop tay or eight poop tea. And then we got bored and quit for about, you know, 20 years. <laughs> and I was just insomniac one night and sat down, pulled open the Oxford Shorter English Dictionary and just pounded out a really long palindrome and just discovered to my shock that I had, without knowing it, picked up all the skills that were required. And it was not actually that hard for me. So then, of course, just as you all know, total obsession, everything, can't read anything forwards, uh, yeah. cranking out hundreds of palindromes, and, and eventually it turned into a magazine. I remember at school we used to do 
if we did anything palindromic, it was line unit palindromes. Oh, so right. Taught that. Hmm. Uh, but right. I didn't really get into it then. I I got into palindromes through uh, formal poetry. So oh. I, was, I learned about meter, and I, I learned, and I discovered that I was a better poet when I, I applied these metrical rules. And then I realized, well, you know, there are there are tougher rules I could be applying here. Right. So and that's how I got into it. Uh, right. Laurie, how how did you end up doing this? Yeah, I uh, I never learned about palindromes in school, uh, but I read a lot of Martin Gardner books as a kid, and that was my introduction to puzzles of of all sorts. And um, yeah, I remember uh, just you know these great books with these these adorable cartoons and and thinking palindromes. Wow! And one of them was Hat Utah, which is funny because I ended up living in Utah. And that always sort of stuck in my mind. I never tried to write them until I came across uh, years later, Mark's palindromist zine and saw that there was a forum where people were submitting, were writing their own palindromes and submitting them. And I submitted one to that and Mark was very encouraging. And so I said, oh, well, huh, I'll, I'll keep doing this. And, and of course, you know, it's, it's, it's a sickness. Uh, it, it took over. <laughs> it is, isn't it? it, it... <laughs> I, you know, people people say, "How do I get into palindromes?" And I'm tempted to say to them, "Don't just, just don't. Do, do something don't. else." The question is how to get out of them. Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned there about line unit palindromes. I, I don't know whether between you, you want to discuss the the different kinds of palindromes that are available because I think that the one people are obviously most familiar with is is the letter unit palindrome and, and just to keep it brief things like taco cat and race car just every letter is reversed but there are other forms you can use aren't there yeah well, i'd like to ask mark about this i mean what's older the that's letter a or the really word? good question and i don't know if we want to jump into some of the personalities of palindromes yet but there's this that the the reputed creator of palindromes at least according to the roman epigrammist marshall is a, a Greek Hellenistic author named Sotades the Obscene of Maranea, who lived roughly 280 BCE uh, and, and wrote in the shadow of the Great Library of Alexandria, where a lot of wordplay innovations were created, such as the anagram that Lycophron created, or the acrostic that Nicander did, and Simeus's egg, the shaped poetry that looked like the thing it was describing, the egg. And the thing is, almost all of his materials were destroyed, probably by the Christian monks who preserved manuscripts for the most part, uh, for a variety of reasons uh, we could get into. Uh, but uh, none of the fragments, we only have 13 fragments of his work, none of them is a letter for letter palindrome. The best guess is that he was doing uh, metrical palindromes, like you mentioned, studying meter uh, and getting into poetry that way. Apparently, either individual verses of his were a different meter in the reverse direction or were still the same meter in the same direction. Or some people arguably uh, say that he, he created his own meter, the Sotidean. And some people say that the Sotidean itself is essentially hexameter backwards. And also the other thing about Sotades that's interesting is that he was sort of the first great literary queer outlaw writer. Um, and he wrote in the Argot of the Canadoi, who were these uh, effeminate dancers, some have called them, but it was, it was much more uh, transgressive in Greek culture, which is very rigidly gendered at that time. So it's tempting to kind of think of them vaguely as, as sort of like drag queens right now, but um, uh, obviously that nobody was lip syncing. And they wrote their own songs. They had their own argot. Uh, so it's kind of a combination of like underground rap, you know, in, in sort of a, a slang of a despised minority, uh, as well as they had their own music and, and their own rhythms. And Sotadis turned their rhythms into a meter. He and Sappho are the only people who have a meter bearing their name. All the others are more descriptive. And uh, it... it <laughs> His meter is kind of queer, you know, and there's a professor from the University of Warwick who described it, his great crime as taking uh, Homer's great manly, uh, he, he wrote a parody of the Iliad, and he said his great crime was taking Homer's manly epic and rewriting it into his own more flexible, effeminate, skippier beat. 
So that was probably the first, was a metric palindrome. We don't have any surviving letter-by-letter -letter palindromes uh, until the first century BCE. And interestingly enough, they were school exercises found in Teb Tunis, Egypt, in Greek, uh, that, that were just literally things were marked like they had, you know, um, uh, uh, here's a sentence with all the letters of the alphabet in it. Here's a sentence of the same, backwards and forwards. And those are actually the oldest palindromes we know of, uh, letter by letter. So that they're very short ones then? Like the, uh, it's full the sentence. Uh, you know, it, it's a normal sentence length, uh, the, the, the early letter by letter ones. The metric ones, um, again, there's only 12 fragments, and I'm not sure even any of those, you know, th there are later verses that Roman grammaticians note that, uh, in, in fact, one in Virgil at the very beginning of the Aeneid, about line seven of the Aeneid, uh, musa mihi causas, you know, muses tell me of the, um, and that actually is uh, 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 this, the same meter, I believe, in reverse, which is almost impossible. It's not something that would spontaneously happen. A couple of people have argued that it was an accident, but it's almost certain that Virgil planned that and wrote that and right at the beginning of his most famous book. So that, that's kind of the archetypal illustration that a lot of, uh, a lot of Roman grammaticians would cite. In English, we use something uh, we call it qualitative meter, where right. it's stress based. In classical languages, it's called quantitative meter, and it's based on syllable length. And, and when particularly you're... the vowels, is it, as I understand it? Exactly. If you have a double vowel, that's generally a, a long syllable, or a vowel followed by a double consonant. So really, even though we're talking about metrical palindromes here, there is this letristic aspect to it. Right. So you are still working at the level of the letter to try to construct these. So I find that very interesting. Are there metrical English palindromes? I don't think so, but you can you can use quantitative meter in English. It's just, it's not as natural. Uh, right. So you could do it. Maybe I will. Yeah, <laughs> or, or, or do There's one with stress. Do, do a qualitative palindrome. Yeah, I mean, that, that is also possible. Uh, Sometimes you can't always hear things. I You know, I don't think we hear meter nearly as naturally as Romans did, for example. Was yeah, that... we, don't hear, we don't hear the syllable length the same way, but, yeah. but we have our own meter really, which is stress-based. So the difference between the words rebel and rebel, right. it's the same, it's spelled the same way, but we know that there's a difference between them quite intuitively, because one is right. trochaic and the other is iambic. I, yeah. I have a question. Uh, when do we first see word unit palindromes? The oldest one I know of is actually the uh, words that God spoke to Moses from the burning bush, which is, you know, it, the, the events then portrayed, I think, around 1200 BCE, though people say Exodus wasn't written till about 600 BC. But uh, in, in, uh, in Hebrew, is it Hebrew or Aramaic? I think it's Hebrew. Um, it's uh, Ahye, Asher, Ahye. And we can actually hear the repetition, even in the King James translation, I am who am, which is probably better translated as I am that I am, or I am because I am, or like, fuck off, human, who are you to ask me who I am? I'm a burning bush that doesn't consume. Back off. <laughs> yeah, that's not the literal translation. No, no. <laughs> but I think it was implied. How many pestilences do I need to send? Of course, we've got a problem here. Of, there is a difference between a, an accidental palindrome and an intentional one. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that wasn't intentional. Oh, I think it almost certainly was. Uh, I mean, there's a poetic quality, I guess, that, that would... Yeah, I mean, th there's a power of it. In fact, it was quite common in older cultures uh, to have uh, what they call in Latin the vocus magicae. The, the, you know, it looks like voice is magical. Uh, uh, the, the words of God, essentially. Words that humans didn't speak or create are very often palindromes in different languages. I don't know if you're familiar with the Greek magical papyri, which are uh, often written in, in Greek in, or Coptic in, found in the Egyptian deserts, uh, say roughly from the, uh, from, uh, uh, the first century BCE until about the fourth century. 
uh, CE, and there are all sorts of magic spells and curses. This is where we know the Ouroboros, the snake eating its own tail. And a lot of these formula are palindromic, and they're not meant to be translated or understood because they're the words of God. You couldn't grasp it. And in fact, the, the, the reversibility is taken very often as the marker of the power of these words. They have more than just a, a literary meaning that uh, this is something you can't grasp or that's ineffable or, or, or whatever. So it, it, it's actually very common. There's, I've seen El Elohim uh, word squares in Hebrew. I haven't been able to pin down the date for when those are created, but an actual word square like the Sator square, Rota square, um, that's five by five and all the characters are the same in every direction. There's actually quite a few. It, it's actually pretty common. Is this where we get, uh, talking about the magical words, is this where we get abracadabra Literally. from? Yes, that was... Um, Originally, a word ablanathanalba, and this was among the one of the most common words in the Greek magical papyri, and that it was corrupted later into abracadabra and still used today. Um, there's other ones that are sometimes literally so long as to be unpronounceable. There's like a 59 letter palindrome, and in fact, a lot of these are based on Jewish culture. Uh, the 59 one is called the Ayao palindrome and it starts out i a e o in our approximation of those greek coptic letters and that's just another version of yahweh so that's uh, very common uh that you know i i don't know how what percentage of the population jews were but everyone respected their power and other people stole their power the thing that's cool about these greek magical papyri is they're totally syncretic they'll take anything from oh that's syrian okay that looks tough you know, and Roman and Greek and Egyptian. Certainly there's a lot of Egyptian stuff in there because this was physically in Egypt for the most part. Uh, and and uh, they just, anything that looked pretty badass, they would put into their spells. And there were healing spells, protective spells, binding spells, compel someone to sleep with me, you know, any of that stuff. And uh, there were quite a few different palindromic figures. Like you were talking earlier, Clara, about, you know, it's not only words, sometimes images too, and the, the Ouroboros would be circling the spell. Or sometimes you would actually take the very long palindromes and write them in a circle like an Ouroboros so that the sentence was almost literally eating its own tail and then have your magical spell inside of it. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. The, the magical aspects are palindromes considered holy or are they considered evil? And that seems to change throughout history a little bit. Depending I'm not on sure that was a distinction that was made in the Greek magical papyri. Yeah. I think powerful was the word they were looking oh. for. But and later, holy or evil is pretty much up to the person who wields the power. But later, Christianity would look at palindromes, it seems, as a sort of dark art. And yet, at the same time, there are instances where it's considered very holy. Absolutely. Because um, they, they appropriated the Seder Square, which I think is something. Right. Unless, unless there's another stage, we could perhaps get onto that now, because that's something we all Sure, love. sure. Well, and then, so uh, there's also a whole separate tradition. So we've been talking about metric palindromes and letter-for-letter -letter palindromes and the Wokus Magikai, which are three different branches of... of <clears throat> what you might call multi-directional writing is, is the phrase I've come up with recently, trying to look for a general thing. But there's the fourth category, which is the word square, like the Rotas or Sator square. Uh, but it's actually much, much older than that. There's examples going back, uh, you know, into Egypt in, in I don't know, 1200 BCE. Uh, and, and a lot of them were blocks of letters that were symmetrical that read backwards as well as forwards, but they weren't meant to be read that way. They're what uh, what some people call uh, labyrinths. Uh, I think uh, Ulrich Ernst is the leading scholar on this, and Dick Higgins was a non-scholarly writer who did incredible amounts of research. Um, and, and I think they, they would both refer to these as labyrinths. It's almost a way of hiding a message in the middle, yeah. uh, like this Elohim square. You, you So imagine a 25 letter square five by five you start with the letter in the center 
And very often with these, you go one letter to the right up, one to the right up until you get to the corner, but you can also go in every direction because it's uh, symmetrical. And so it, it's almost a, a cryptogram of sorts. And so that's the tradition. I mean, so th that was a very long tradition before the Rotas Sator square came up. And I think that was kind of revolutionary because it was in the same form as those other ones, which is very eye grabbing and, and certainly would catch your attention. And, and I think that the thing that people often forget, I think a lot of modern scholars try to turn this into a sentence that you just read, what I call like blocks of letters or like a letter stack. Uh, a word stack, right? It, but it's not just a word stack, it, it's a block. And not only does it work in different directions, but one of the great things of the word stack is that it's immediately graspable by someone who doesn't know the language. And I can speak from experience here. I've been studying Latin palindromes and word squares for 25 years. I don't speak any Latin. <laughs> But I can find the palindrome. I mean, you give me a, a page crammed with Latin text, I can find the palindrome on it. I don't need to know the letter. And I think it's the word search. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I know. I just think because it is graphical, it appeals to people who are illiterate. And I think that was very powerful in in Roman times. And so my theory of the of the the rota square, it may or may not have had an original meaning, but it didn't matter because it just looked really cool. And people who couldn't even read could see that it looked cool. And you could tell it was roughly Latin because four of the words were Latin and they kind of sounded like Latin. And you know, if you could sound it out a little, you could go, well, that's probably Latin. It's, we know it's not Greek. We can see the shape of the letters. And, and I, I think it was kind of a Roman military emblem because you'll notice that most of the, the Rotas squares in the early days, all of them starting with Rotas, including the one just down the road from you guys in Siren Sister in England, which we made a pilgrimage to, yeah. um, uh, they're all on the outskirts of the Roman Empire. They're all on the far frontier where they're right up against the barbarians. And I think it was like, we're Rome, damn it, check this out. And the people were like, I don't read Latin. Just, just look at it. Just look at it. They go, whoa. <laughs> you just see it works in all the directions. And you don't have to. It's almost better if you don't know what it means. It's just, it's powerful. And maybe better not mess with them. You know, there's yeah. something I've been thinking a lot uh, about recently, which is just, you know, are palindromes fundamentally visual, including musical palindromes, sound palindromes, uh, possibly excluding phonetic palindromes. Uh, but yeah, exactly. We're, the, the meaning is not necessarily, uh, we, we don't have to be able to understand it. We're looking at visual formal properties um, in most of these palindromes. And I, I think that's something that's quite interesting. On the podcast we've just recorded, which is a, a special on women in visual poetry, uh, we talked about, oh, I. I made a point to talk about uh, Sue Hui and her Oh, great. Stargate, which, of course, I, I can't understand the word of it, obviously. But, yeah. but I love it still. Yeah. And it's because it's got that, that visual quality and the fact you know it does work. That right. You trust that it does work and it does say something. And the more you read, the more amazing it gets. Yeah. I mean, so this, is, this was going on in China in the fourth century. Fourth century. Yeah. There wasn't Optation uh, Porphyrius writing also in the fourth century. So it's kind of crazy that very similar uh, work was being done at almost the same time by people who couldn't possibly have had any direct connection between each other and certainly could not have taken their art to the extreme that they did, even if, you know, some theoretical merchant showed them a picture, you know, like, oh, I'm going to write an 841 character, completely reversible Chinese poem that can form 7,000 different rhyming poems, depending where you start on it. Because a guy showed me a picture. No, it doesn't work. <laughs> As you guys know, to get the, the level to actually create something worthwhile out of an art, you can start with the concept, but it takes years after that. So I just find that astonishing that, that, on the op literal opposite ends of the earth, uh, two people were doing essentially the same thing. Yeah, well, this happens a lot, actually. There's, there's, there is this aspect of convergent evolution mm. culturally. 
So, yeah, I mean, we're big proponents of the fact that visual poetry and constraint based poetry do go together. They do have a strong connection. Hmm. Yeah. And and I think that as well, like you say, Laurie, I, I think we are very much it's in our nature to be drawn to the symmetrical. So that's it, isn't it? Like you say, you've got a, a palindrome. Even if you can't necessarily read, you could see the symmetry of the letters if it's a right. single sentence or, right. or, or a poem. It, it, the same way we're drawn to faces that are symmetrical and find butterflies beautiful, it, it, it's all related. I would go um, further and say that the, the symmetry gives the, uh, the sentence an illusion of truth. You know what I mean? So like if yeah. you say, uh, sit on a potato pan, Otis. Does anyone ever go, wait a minute, there's no such thing as a potato pan? <laughs> no, they just go sit on a potato pan, Otis, that's a great insult. And you just accept it or uh, something that it will be hard for me to communicate to listeners here, but I know that Lori and Anthony and Clara know, our friend Martin Clear, the reigning world palindrome champion from Australia, came up with a rather long palindrome that included the phrase homemade illustrated underpants in the middle. <laughs> What's crazy about that is that when you reverse it, you get the word solid. Which yeah, <laughs> well, of course you do. <laughs> yeah, something solid and homemade illustrated underpants. But again, there, there's a, um, you know what I'm saying? It's like there's a compelling nature to a palindrome where you, you read that and you go, oh, I guess there are, homemade illustrated underpants you don't go oh that doesn't make any sense there's no such thing you know it 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 makes it, somehow it tricks the brain into wanting it to be true yeah form comes before meaning yeah or form becomes meaning or form like verifies meaning it's sort of like in a modern sense i don't know if you guys uh do any computer programming or you're familiar with the checksum which is a. Uh, 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 w with a computer file, it's like a calculation you can do. So like, let's say you get some software and you don't know if it's been hacked and someone put a virus in it or whatever. So someone does a checksum, which is a calculation you can do on the entire file that can only produce one result for that amount uh, of, of characters, of binary characters. So that's your checksum. Anyway, it's a calculation you could run and then it's quick to run the calculation. You don't need to look at the whole thing. You just run the calculation. It gives you this short answer and it's either the same or it's not. So if anybody's tampered with it, you don't get the same checksum answer. And in a way, palindromes are the great checksum of certainly medieval paleography, which is something I've been going, you know, these old manuscripts, people are quoting Latin, the, the monks writing it didn't necessarily speak Latin. They were copying stuff over. They made so many mistakes. There's so much corruption. But with the palindromes, they can just look at the palindrome and go, oh, no, I guess I got that one wrong. It doesn't match the guy on the other side. So it's sort of an internal checksum uh, built into it so that you can literally tell whether you got it right or not. And they still so, screw it up, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but less often. I think they survive longer than other forms of text. So we've got so we got to the Sata Square, and, and then I suppose we get the Dark Ages, so there's... Not really much to to gather oh, from there. Well, well, don't ever use the word dark ages to a medievalist. For one thing, I'll tell you right now, they will take your head off. That is really <laughs> that's that's really considered uncool uh, now, uh, even if you're not Merovingian. But the irony is, they've recently done studies showing that there were some massive uh, volcan volcanic ex uh, explosions in Iceland and other places that put out a huge amount of dust in the air so that it literally was a dark age <laughs> after all that controversy. And, and that's one reason there was decline is the crops failed, there was some starvation and it was harder to keep certain trading networks going. Uh, People didn't have time to write palindromes. <laughs> busy looking for food, you know? It's, it's hard to juggle those responsibilities. But uh, yeah, there's, there's actually very few. Do you know about Luxorius? I don't think so. So he's a palindromist, uh, like Optation Porphyrius. He he's from North Africa. He lived in Carthage. 
after Rome fell, but not long. And it, they were still kind of going through the motions of Roman culture in Carthage, which had been rebuilt after being salted and all that problem. They kind of got over that. Um, and then the the Vandals, the, the kingdom of the Vandals, who did not, despite their popular reputation, smash windows and write graffiti everywhere. They were just a normal Germanic kingdom that came down, conquered France and Spain, and then the Visigoths kicked them out. But the only way they had to keep going was further south. So they crossed into Africa and took over Carthage in that area. And so they had a kingdom down there for, I don't know, 50, 60 years, uh, uh, late 400s, early 500s. And they kind of kept going through the motions of Roman culture. And Luxorius was an epigrammist or epigrammatist, epigrammist, I don't know how to say that, uh, who fancied himself after Marshall. But really what he is more of was just a really bad stand-up comedian uh, <laughs> by our modern things. He would go to the forum. He would recite these uh, these epigrams. And he had names like, to a noisy and raging dwarf, or to a fat and unlucky falconer. And he, would, he was trying to crack jokes, and they're just terrible. They're just really, really lame. Um, like here's well, different one, times, uh, Mark. Come on. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm sorry. I, speaking as a stand-up comic, I've met this guy in current times as well. <laughs> he's just not famous. He's not Dave Chappelle, you know. He, he, he's not, uh, you know, uh, Eddie Izzard. But uh, like, here's I'll sh read you a quick one. To a drunkard who eats nothing but is forever drinking, since you alone often drink as many bowls of wine as all other men put together. And you never have enough at any hour. And scorn bread and care to take nothing but wine, Nerfa. I am no longer going to call you a man, but a wide mouth flagon filled to the brim. Wah, wah. <laughs> Is there a reason you're saying that to me, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not suggesting that you are Nerfa. Though I really like that name, N-E-R-F-A. Yeah. But that's kind of his whole his whole genre. And then he just slips a palindrome into one of them after ridiculing palindromes and saying they're a, a waste of time and low qu low class or whatever. But then he just pops in a palindrome of, you know, not very high quality. So this is about 520, 530 CE. And then we don't have anything until about 800 But uh, that, that has survived. I mean, there could have been palindromes written all over the place that uh, they just, you know, got burned up for firewood or whatever. Um, but at that time, it's interesting, you were talking about how they were often associated with evil, and certainly they were. You know, there was the idea of the witch's prayer, which read backwards, and uh, a, a lot of the satanic rituals were done in reverse, dances done in reverse, verses read backwards, etc. But at the same time, the next palindrome we have in 805... Uh, is by Rabanus Morris, who became a bishop. And in fact, they're still singing some of his songs today. Right? So early musician, as was Huckbald, uh, another early palindromist of, of the Carolingian time. Um, but he wrote, uh, it, it was, uh, the whole thing was in honor of the great cross. And it was very much like Optation Porphyrius. If you've seen these, right, Anthony? They're, they're like, uh, and, and Laurie, they're like grids, giant squares of poetry, and then he would draw shapes inside them, and there would be different words marked by the shapes. So they had, they actually meant different things in their two different uses, the exact same letter in the grid, and the last two were palindromes. That was his big, you know, Ta-da! Big, you know, <laughs> what do you call it? His closer, his his, his big <laughs> grand finale, was uh, two palindromes in the shape of the uh, cross, and and on the last one, there's a little drawing of himself down in the corner. His signature was drawing himself around letters that spelled out his name, and he's worshiping his palindrome that he wrote. Um, or you could say he's worshiping Christ's cross, but I prefer to think of it he's worshiping his palindrome that he wrote. So, and that was, you know, that was like a high peak of Christian culture at the time. He presented it literally to the Pope 40 years later in a, in a copy of the original book. Uh, and it was reprinted hundreds of times. It's still very popular. There was a, 
huge conference on it like 20 years ago and a bunch of new books put out new editions of all of Rabanus's work. So uh, there were some that they considered it very high, very, very Christian, very holy and that sort of thing. And then the satanic ones slipped in there too. Yeah. And isn't there around this, this time or a bit later where the Seder Square makes a return as a, a Christian symbol? Well, that's interesting. You know, the, the, we have we have no reason to think, despite early theories about anagrams, that the original Rota Square was ever connected to Christianity. I mean, it's theoretically possible, but look at it this way. The oldest ones we found were in Pompeii, and because of some earthquake damage, we're pretty sure they were written before 62 CE. That's only 29 years after Christ was crucified. And we're talking on the Roman Peninsula, way across from Jerusalem. I guess it's yeah. theoretically possible. It's not likely, so, is it? It seems pretty unlikely. Um, in a different language, Christians didn't speak Latin at that time. They spoke Greek. They wouldn't have written in in Latin letters. They would have written in Greek letters. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of reasons that it, it doesn't really make any sense. And like you say, we, we don't see them at Christian places. We see them at Roman military places. Uh, or in the case of Pompeii, it's just graffiti in, in downtown Pompeii on busy streets. In one case, right across the street from a brothel. Not really something you would associate uh, with religion. But then the next group of squares we see, and these are the first ones that start with Sator instead of Rotos, are uh, again found in the Egyptian desert. And then down into Nubia and Ethiopia, Abyssinia, um, that whole area. And these are very explicitly associated with Christianity. They're written in Coptic letters, not Latin letters. So it looks like K-top, if you see one, C-A-T-O-P. That's the unseal S and the, the in Greek letters, the R looks like a P. Uh, so it looks like K-top potak instead of you know, Sator Rotas. And all of these have one uh, difference. Instead of a repo, it says a reto. And instead of opera, it says Oterra. So whatever theory you might have about the original Rotas square forming a sentence, it sure doesn't apply to all of the squares written anywhere in the East from, you know, the, Probably not before five six hundred. Um, some people argue they're a little older, <clears throat> but from about five six hundred until twelve hundred, there are dozens and dozens of these Sator squares we found, all in Christian context, up through Turkey, down to Ethiopia, all through there. And they're very often identified. They're named as like the. Did you know that the wounds on, that Christ had on the cross have names? Well, these are the names. They're, it's like the names of the wounds on Christ are Sator, Otera, Tenet, Atara, and, and Rotas. Or, or sometimes they were the names of the nails used to, to nail Christ to the cross. In one case, they were used as the three wise men. And then sometimes these are corrupted, you know, like o, Oderapot or something like that. So, but it, it actually was Christian from many hundreds of years from about five, 600 to 1200. And then it jumps back into the West uh, in the Carolingian times, right about the same time Rabanus wrote his, his book, uh, uh, right about 800, 805. Uh, it starts to be written in margins of manuscripts uh, and put on churches, but never explained. No one's ever saying this is what it means. We don't have anybody even attempts to claim there is a meaning for this as a sentence until about 1500, late 1400s in a Greek manuscript. But people put it up again as a symbol of power. Um, and you have to think that, you know, uh, early 800s, late 700s, that's when uh, Al Quinn put together the great library that uh, around Charlemagne and started pulling together all the books and, and rebuilding knowledge uh, are you guys Game of Thrones fans? I was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Well, I think the whole thing about, you know, the maesters and they had that massive library in the center 
you know, I think that was all based on Al Quinn and Charlemagne's uh, uh, rebuilding of all that dusty lost knowledge. Uh, so you have to think that probably they got hold of one of these Sator squares from the Coptic world, from the, the Christian uses of it in the Coptic world. And, you know, and this is a funny thing about this kind of history. Maybe like one dude, the first dude who copied it over, just got the P wrong and got it as a T. So for hundreds of years, that's what everybody has. And then by the time it gets back to the West, they're going, oh, I, wasn't that a P? I thought that was a P. And then they correct it, and then it gets back on track over there. I have a, a question. Um, you're talking about these... Uh these Sator squares with some differences in the spelling yeah. of the words. Uh, I have a, an obsession with double word squares where the horizontal words are different from the vertical words, oh. sometimes just slightly so, uh, right. you know, palindromic or not, uh, but especially if they're palindromic. Uh, have you come across any of these in your research? Uh, there, I've seen more recent ones. I haven't uh, looked for those as much. It's kind of amazing how much stuff there is out there. Oh, actually, I do have one of those. I think it might be the same down as across. So there's different ways you could do these, right? There's somewhere the across words are different than the down words. And there's somewhere it's not palindromic, but it's the same, right? And honestly, I don't remember which one this is, but there's a, in the same Coptic circles, they have this one. It's uh, It's something like, Alpha, Leon, Fona. Mm, I can't remember what the last one is, but uh, it, it, it's a very common word. I can look it up here in a second. It's very common in Coptic circles, and it's four beasts of the Christian Bible. Uh, uh, the lion, obviously, one is like a hawk. The <laughs> It's tempting now. The third one is spelled P-H-O-N-E, and we go, the phone? No, it's a different word in, in Greek of that time, but it's hard for me to get past looking at the uh, the phone. But this is a very common one. I think it is symmetrical down as well as across. Okay. Uh, you know, the, the modern one that I always think of is leave Ellen alone, venom enemy, which goes back to the 1850s, I believe. And that's the best uh, English one. But there's very few that that seem to work well that are palindromic or even just as sentences do you, do you have some good um uh, what did you call them the the two different uh double word squares double word squares what are some good double word squares well you know uh, anthony and i actually a few months ago wrote some that were palindromic that were double word squares oh um, really yeah i would love to I, see those that's really cool i'd have to Let's find them i don't point. recall them yeah <laughs> So yeah, the across is palindromic, uh, with yeah. with with splits. Not you know because of course it's terribly difficult to do um, in English uh, a five by five palindromic word square unless you you have breaks um, uh, in the lines. Um, and then it's different a uh, uh, vertical. Anthony, yours yours was devil exam, deedle exam. Is that what I'm rec recalling? Something like that. Yeah, I should know. <laughs> I think I think mine was trade going across and trope going downwards, and I don't oh, recall the, cool. the the rest of it. But they were they yeah, yeah. It's a it, right <laughs> <laughs> off the top of your head. <laughs> anyway, how hard can it be? <laughs> we'll, we'll find we'll find That's them. And we'll put them in the description. By the way, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so you remember the discussion? We did come up with a couple English five-letter palindromic word squares. Uh, Jeff Grant. And I each came up with one that I think are, it depends, you have to squint a little. Uh, um, uh, uh, Tessa, uh, Egats, Saga's Stage Asset, which I interpret as Tessa, Egats, Saga's are, uh, you know, an asset on stage if you're doing theater productions, maybe because I'm married to a theater person. Um, Egats is a little bit of a stretch. Most people <laughs> are more familiar with Egads, but I did find an actual, I found two documented uses in sports stories, only one of which I wrote. 
Yes. There was it's only your one. Arepo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, but there was one. I mean, but unlike a repo, you know what it means, even if it's not the way people normally spell it, right? No one has ever been confused for what egats means in that in that section. So I, I take that as if if that's what a word is, right? You put some letters down, you say them, people know what you mean. That's what else is a word than that? That's my defense. I'll, I'll but it was say, but I've got to... Parts apart, radar, trap, a strap. Which I like because it only uses, the only vowel is A. Uh, what I don't like about it, of course, is that the fourth line is trap A. So it's the fourth line is two words. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, there are scholars who think that the, the Sator Rota square is in that format as well. It was R Po. Yeah, right. <laughs> po, of course, referring to the Teletubby. Yeah, of course. <laughs> So it'd be Rotas Opera Tenant. So like circling operas have or are po. <laughs> Teletubbies is an opera. That's what it saying. was about the Teletubbies all along. <laughs> I can't believe no one ever saw that. That's insane. Uh, maybe is, isn't the Po a river? Oh, yes, it is. Circling the river encircling. Yeah, so there's that. I think in, we've, we've in, just uh, discovered something in, here. In, think, in, think, right around Rome, right? I think it is an Italian river, isn't it? Wow. It goes in a circle? <laughs> Maybe <laughs> it, it might have like some nice oxbow lakes that an Italian Right, lake right. <laughs> it, it probably bends at some point. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I see, I totally believed you there for a second. I was like, oh, it goes in a circle. Well, that must be a big tourist attraction. Um, <laughs> Do you guys have lazy rivers at, at um, public swimming pools there? I don't know. I, think, I don't know what they are. It's I, a I thing in the United States that a lot of more recent public swimming pools, they have what they call the lazy river where they create an artificial current with jets in a little river that goes through the public swimming pool. Oh. We, we have that, well, the one I can remember from my childhood was not that lazy. It was actually quite uh, vigorous. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't get, you sort of got jostled around in a circle oh, and hit your head off the walls. Like but... children drowned every day. <laughs> you, you certainly bashed your head a few times if you weren't paying oh, attention. Wow. Wow. This wasn't it was, it just was, like the output of a nuclear power plant or something. No, I, I think they called it the rapids, though, rather than, yeah, the lazy river sounds wow. like a relaxing thing. No, we, we had yeah. the rapids. <laughs> I think we have more lawsuits in the United States, so the rapids <laughs> changed into the lazy river. <laughs> I think I've seen a photo of people, like, surfing on an artificially created uh, jet stream kind of thing. I think you get it on like cruise ships, don't you? Yeah, out the back? <laughs> no, like on, on the deck of the cruise ship. They have oh, like okay. surf pools. I thought it was like kiteboarding where they just give you a long, you know, like uh, uh, <laughs> water skiers where you have the long thing you hang on to and they just rope you out to the back of the cruise boat behind the jets and it just psh, blasts you. That'd be fun. Don't let go. <laughs> Right, I think we need to get back anyway, to the right? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what were we talking about? It's not a water park. <laughs> well, I was just saying, as long as you have the technology to do uh, the rapids, you could convert the Po River into a literal circle. And then lazy boaters could just drift down in their rubber raft, bouncing off people. Yeah. So maybe that's what the Sator Square is about. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Granted, when, when you say it like that, it sounds a little unlikely. I, I have to concede. More likely than Teletubbies, though. <laughs> oh, Poe. I like Poe. Anyway. Yes. <laughs> so it's, well, it's, it's now a good time to get on to musical palindromes. Sure. Before, so I think we're on the verge of, of getting on to uh, English, the first English palindrome. So maybe if we cut to music. Have it a musical interlude, and then we oh, can get back to sure. that. So, Laurie, let's talk. Let's talk music. And there are various ways to write musical palindromes. I don't know what the earliest would be. I know there are some from 
the 1300s that used table cannons. Well, you know, Bach, I mean, much later, of course, Bach did, uh, in Bach's musical offering, he did not only a crab cannon, um, which is, I think, probably the most uh, palindromic equivalent in the sense that one line is played forward with the exact same music played backwards um, at the same time. That's that's the, the crab cannon. But the... Uh, a table canon is very interesting. It's palindromic in, in two different ways because it's not just the retrograde of playing the same uh, figure backwards at the same time, but it's also upside down. Uh, so a piece of music would be set on a table between two musicians and one would read it right side up for that person and the other would be reading it right side up for them. So both retrograde and inversion uh, in the table canons. And so there's an example of that in, in Bach's musical offering, um, in addition to the, the famous crab canon in that. Um, I, I, there are certainly much earlier examples um, uh, that I'm not, I'm not so familiar with kind of medieval or, yeah. or Renaissance music. Show has one, right? Yeah, there's definitely uh, one of, uh, by Michaud, I've seen mentioned. My end is my before. beginning, or whatever. He probably didn't right. say it. Right, my end is my beginning, yeah. but yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, the all kinds of uh, figures and um, fugues and canons. There is a a a, a mirror canon, um, actually one of these kind of inversion canons that happens in a piece I just played a few months ago, the the Mozart C minor wind serenade, the third movement trio. Uh, has this wonderful thing, but with the two oboes and the two bassoons, um, where again you're you're playing uh, the figure upside down, and it's it's uh, really quite a remarkable piece of writing. Is um, it hard to play? No, no, it's not oh. difficult to play. No, oh. um, and and structurally, you know, I think you can kind of hear. Uh, I think it, it's easier to hear something that is inverted, perhaps, than something that is backwards. Something. I mean, if you play "Happy Birthday" backwards, it sounds very different. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it, it's hardly recognizable. Uh, or, or "Twinkle," you know, but uh, inverted. You know, hearing the intervals. Okay, it's a, a third up this way, a fourth up this way, a fourth down this way in terms of of pitch. And, and I'm I'm speaking specifically of what well, in the, in this case both uh, pitch and rhythmic uh, relationships being inverted or or backwards. Um, one of my favorite musical examples uh, is Haydn's Palindrome Symphony. Uh, that's kind of the designation given to his 47th symphony. He wrote 104. I have maybe played 30 of them. I've not gotten to play the Palindrome Symphony, sadly. Um, but uh, the, it's also the, thir the, thir uh, the, the minuet and trio. It's a minuetto al reverso is what he writes. And um, he, again, it's... Uh, he writes uh, th the first strain, so to speak, of the minuet, and and then it's and then it's played backwards. Um, and it's not only notated in pitch and rhythm palindromically; uh, the dynamics are are printed in reverse as well um, when when it appears backwards, which is kind of a nice figure. There are all sorts of different parameters that one can can play around with in terms of reversal in music and so it's kind of fun that he did that with the the dynamics as well especially in a minuet where you there are certain stresses you know it's a dance um so certain kind of givens in terms of oh this would probably be loud here or this would be soft oh but it's not oh. um so that's kind of an interesting example the palindrome symphony i'm interested in the motivation for doing it too which, which i think laurie you hinted at this earlier that it might just be a visual thing just or a uh, a structural thing rather than something that people are supposed to notice because when you listen to palindromic music if it's really simple you can tell if it's just goes duh, 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 duh. but <laughs> uh, <laughs> if it's any more complicated than that you don't notice it's a palindrome yeah the, there are these hidden structures and you know i think i think you know certainly for me and probably for you guys as well when you're you're writing palindromes there's kind of this this excavation um, aspect to it. You're uncovering these hidden relationships that are already present in the language. Um, you know, you're, you're finding them to some, of course, there's a lot of creative work involved in them, but 
to some extent, uh, it was it was always already there. Um, it it was a possibility of the language, the a potential potentiality of the language that you've uncovered, and I think something is is happening as well in in music. Although of course it's um, you know you don't have these kind of strict spelling constraints like we do with uh, with written language. Um, but yeah, it is very very difficult unless it's something very simple to hear that something. Um, in a musical performance, you know, and something that is temporal like that is palindromic versus if you are looking at the the kind of visual nomenclature, like a musical score, for example, then then of course you can see that. The, one of the most beautiful musical examples, I think, visually is uh, in Act Three of uh, Berg's opera Lulu, and that that's my favorite. If if someone wants to see an example of a musical palindrome, I, I show them like the the hinge point of Lulu, where where it reverses, and it's this just wonderful figure. You can instantly see that it's it's palindromic. Oh. Yeah, um, there is there are other ways of of doing musical palindromes. One of my other favorites is the Hindemith opera, uh, there and back again. Um, it's a very short op operatic sketch. It's only about 12 minutes long. And it's not, you know, the, the dramatic action is palindromic. Uh, an event occurs, there's a murder. Yeah. A sage steps in and says, well, this was a very bad idea. And <laughs> magic, magic comes back into the picture. Again, there's this, you know, this interesting connection with palindromes and magic uh, historically. And, he, you know, basically the sage sets everything in reverse at a certain point. Wow. But the the, pitch, the pitches are not put in reverse because it, uh, Hindemith is writing, you know, tonally, even if not diatonically, and uh, so again you have, but structurally, you know, the the arietta occurs in the same position but backwards. You know, the the words are palindromic by line, so essentially you have line groupings uh, of the text of the of the libretto that are, are placed backwards. So it's an, another way in which uh, music can have palindromic elements. I was just going to uh, say, I'm surprised no one's done something like that about Christ's death and resurrection to make a, a palindromic story or, or piece, you know, that you have the death and then back to life as a palindromic mode. That, yeah, that's a very interesting idea. Go for it. <laughs> I, I'm not a composer. You should talk to oh. Anthony. <laughs> okay. There's oh, got thank a guitar you, thank right you for there. saying that, Laurie. I get to, I get to promote my tape. Yes, it's yeah. wonderful. I was mad enough to make a cassette tape, even though nobody owns a cassette player anymore. I do. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And the uh, I and I've got to say as well that the music at the start of this podcast is a palindrome. Oh, okay. So, that's bass guitar and bongos. Uh, anyway, you were, you were, you were, I, I cut you off there, Laura. You were still talking about after Hindemith. Oh, oh no, the, the, those are some of my, my favorite yeah. music examples, but there, you know, there are, there are different aspects. You, you can, you can change the pitches. Those might not be palindromic and you can simply have a uh, palindromic rhythmical figures, for example, or, or uh, right. duration elements. And uh, I think, you know, Anthony did a lot of very uh, creative things with uh, different aspects of of palindromy in in this uh, these works that he just released on on cassette. Um, and he, he uh, the alien drum uh, by duration I thought was was particularly interesting. Yeah, there are several things on that. There there are rhythm only palindromes, mm -hmm. and palindromes where you can have one half faster than the second half, but right. essentially it's still a palindrome. Because you do have that range with music that you perhaps don't get with uh, letter-based literary palindromes. I, I have a question. Um, can you hear the rhythmic palindromes more than the melodic, I guess you'd say, uh, palindromes? Is it more audible? I can't. I can't. And, and again, unless it's really simple. The, the ending of Stravinsky's Firebird, um, I remember being in a rehearsal and our, our associate conductor saying, you know, it's it's mixed meter and, you know, two, two, three, three, you know, what? And he's like, it's a palindrome. And of course, everyone, <laughs> the whole orchestra turns and looks at me, you know. <laughs> um, but I, and, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, ryth a rhythmic palindrome. And um, again, it, they, if they're simple, yes, right. you, you can hear them. But I, 
I've always thought that's kind of interesting that there's this this visual element and and just music, you know, it's this oral art form. Right. But there's also this visual component, you know, there is it's you can point at the Mona Lisa and and you know what the art object is. You, what do you point at if it's you're looking at Beethoven's Fifth Symphony? Right. Um, the score is not the art object in the same way the Mona Lisa is, for example. When you said that, what my visual impression is the man with the magic wand, who you would call the conductor, <laughs> I guess, right? But it's always, there's I always like one things. dude. What's that? I call conductors many things. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? It's like, there's what? There's like 70 people in an orchestra or something, but all we ever see is the one white man with a stick like waving it the person not making any sound right yes, exactly. yeah <laughs> sorry i might be going off on a tangent here yeah, um, no, please please no, Rail. No. this is the time to get it out i'll never I, hear this I, I just had a thought as well obviously going back to this this theme of of good and evil with palindromes and i guess this this still kind of relates to music but it's going back more to the the vocals and I was wondering what you guys thought about backmasking. I'm thinking like oh, the, yeah. the 70s, whether it was intentional or hidden, this idea of, of playing it backwards and and hearing a message in reverse. I think it was one of the earliest conspiracy theories. It just hasn't <laughs> been recognized as such. You know, I mean, it's, it's mostly <laughs> ludicrous. I used to watch some of those Christian preachers for fun in the early days of cable TV, like, you know, the late 1970s and early 1980s. People like Gary Greenwald and uh, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, uh, not Oral Roberts, but there was another guy. Um, uh, and, you know, they were ludicrous. They were, they were entertainers and they were saying ridiculous things. They'd go out on a limb and just make stuff up. There's one guy I remember who was like, uh, and these poor children out in Africa have to sleep in the thorn bushes because, uh, and then you can see that he hadn't really thought through to the end of the sentence and he couldn't. He didn't really have a reason why these poor children would have to sleep in thorn bushes. So he gets kind of confused. Look on his face. He goes, so, uh, so the lions won't eat them. You know, they were just making <laughs> stuff up. I don't think there was any, you know, it's well, possible. They, you could put something in there, but. There, there was a, you know, a big deal. I remember in elementary school that there were these, you know, satanic messages backwards on, I think, yeah. maybe Ju Judas Priest uh, mm -hmm. albums, you know, things like that. And, and uh, yeah, I do. I remember, you know, just this, this outrage, this fear over these backwards satanic messages that were hidden in albums. It was, I had to give a, a presentation on it one time, I remember, uh, yeah. <laughs> in elementary school. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think the reality is if you listen to vocal music backwards, it's this mismatch and you hear all sorts of garbled things and then you can, it's a Rorschach test, really, right? You can find whatever pattern you want to find in it. Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's really hard to do, isn't it? Anyway, if you try and do it intentionally, I think... Well, well think, of, think of Twin Peaks. Mm. And right. Course, yeah, that's, I... yeah, it's used there to sound evil. Right. Or, or think... somehow creepy and, and otherworldly. Well, in almost any any good psychedelic music from the 60s to modern days, whether you look at, you know, I don't know, Robin Hitchcock or whoever, uh, the three o'clock, they all use backward music just to get that distinctive sound effect it has, which is sort of like a vaguely, you know, Middle Eastern sounding music or whatever. Uh, but there's no message there. We've, we've been made aware of one quite solid Phonic palindrome, haven't we? And that's was the one you talked about. Oh. With NASA, the hair wash in the shower. Yes. That, what that now? The phrase, the phrase ha hair wash in the shower. Okay. If you play that backwards, it says hair wash in the shower. Really? And it works yeah. with different languages as well, because we, it, accents, because we tried it and it worked, and NASA's Canadian and he tried it and it oh. works. So, yeah, and hair wash amazing. in the shower. That's exactly where I wash my hair. <laughs> it's like spooky. But that's what's so good about it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, they're, they're very difficult to, to do, I think. So I know you've played with back, back masking a bit and it's. I've tried. It's just, it's a lottery, really. Just try everything and see if, mm -hmm. see if something works. And it often doesn't. I mean, I suppose palindromes in general are a bit like that. You're just yeah. seeing what well, works. 
it's easier to see the pattern. I think there have been a couple um, uh, circus performers, or uh, I think there was somebody who was on a, a late night television show in America who just had the ability to say things backwards. Somehow they just had worked out the trick and they can make the sound backwards of whatever you would say. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's. I'm sure we've all mastered the trick of reading letters backwards to see if there's words hidden in there. And I, I suppose there's no reason a, a child, for whatever strange reason, couldn't have worked that out themselves if they had a tape player and, you know, spent enough time going backwards. Um, but anyway, I've, I've read about a, a few people who did that. It just kind of like as a, as a stunt, you know, or for, you know, busking at the bus station or whatever. The thing is, I think there's something wrong with us for reading everything backwards. But if you're if you're recording everything you say and playing it backwards, that's another level. That's really messed <laughs> up. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I, 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 I'm absolutely with you on that. But on the other hand, I'm an American who's miserable with accents. And I, I almost feel like the ability to hear accents in the way, as near as I can tell, everyone in the UK can tell you where you were born within you know, 30 seconds of talking to you. That seems like a mystical trick to me as well. You know, most Americans only think there's one British accent. <laughs> That's true, yeah. When did you get in from London is what we hear, isn't it? Yeah. But London, yeah. It's just London, it's just London. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah, have a that... friend in London, do you know them? <laughs> You'd almost, um, it, it would be really fun as, as uh, just for a video to record like 50 Americans and ask them to do a British accent. <laughs> I think they'd, Ameri all, they'd all do uh, Al Alfred or uh, Batman, yeah. wouldn't they? Sure. <laughs> well, well, look, I tell you, right now, right now I can ask two people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you, you walked into that. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. No, I... And, and uh, uh, yeah, no, it's true. It, it, we, we really have no idea what the different accents are. So we're just, I suppose, picking something randomly that we saw on television or on the movies. Uh, okay, I'll admit to one. Uh, I, I do work as a stand-up comedian, and I had a bit that referenced uh, Sherlock Holmes. And uh, I had a quote from uh, Watson is his assistant, right? Is that the yeah. name of the guy? Uh, and and I, I invented a bit of British dialect that I'm sure had nothing to do with the original Watson. And I haven't done this bit for a while. Let me uh, let me see if I can recreate it. Um, uh, brilliant, Sherlock! Another case solved. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even sure that was the same accent within the five words of it. And that was kind of Cockneyish, um. I think. I think you're being. I think you're being too kind. It's a bit, yeah, it's a bit Dick Van Dyke, isn't it? <laughs> Laurie, you're free to attempt. <laughs> I am not going to participate in this. Um, <laughs> I I did. I was I was looking here for a. I I learned a, a phonetic script that uh, was a utopian experiment in Utah in pioneer days. Uh, because I came across these kind of rare texts that uh, were written in this script, and it's um, really interesting. Uh, and so I did write a few phonetic palindromes, and I Wait, you was mean trying it's a to remember. Different alphabet? No, it's English, but it's a phonetic script. And and I have a friend who writes in his personal journal in Deseret. That's the name of the script here, and uh, along with Shavian. Uh, which was invented by Shaw. Um, so th think of international phonetic alphabet, but different a different script. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha, okay. Yeah, so, and I liked that because if you use a, um, a phonetic script like that, then it still has that visual element to it, even right. though it's a, you know, it's a sound palindrome. So a couple of them that I came up with were, my rhyme, might I fib if I time my rhyme, um, or, time i fib if i might let's see yeah so it's it's, it's like a phonetic phonemic script um and i think i did i think i did that i think i used an app uh to record myself playing it and then and then reversed it to to make sure it, it sounded the same right. and of course after the the last season of twin peaks i was i was trying to do <laughs> all of that <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> accidentally summoned a demon. But I, and I think... <laughs> so I was going to say, I, I do think the point we're kind of dancing around here a little bit is there is a audio versus visual gulf with palindromes. And I don't know if I've told you the story, but it was clearly illustrated to me by the fact that I started working on palindromes and then started stand-up comedy. And there was just no way to explain palindromes on a stand-up comedy stage to a bunch of people with no visual aids, uh, people at the end of the work week, usually it's Friday or Saturday, they've had a few drinks, uh, and they just want to have fun, and they cannot visualize letters in their head and see that they work in both directions. And it took me 12 years to find a way to, to make palindromes work on stage. And basically, it was by telling it as a story of how stupid I was for trying to use palindromes to impress women when I'm hitting on them. And so... Uh, <laughs> The way I have the story is, you know, I'm telling and, you know, words the same backwards and forwards. And she goes, huh? And I go, yes, exactly like that. H-U-H. <laughs> so then I know this chick is really <laughs> digging me, right? And so that's enough to get even, even a, a drunk crowd that's not visualizing letters. But it's really about how stupid I am, not really about palindromes. But I, I managed to drop a few palindromes in the bit. Uh, you know, simpler palindromes like uh, Yoda's sad, oi. You know, they'll go for that. When, once you get them on board with that. And then, of course, people always like to feel more clever than the other people in the audience. Like, I think that's what detective novels are all about. Like, you're, you, you have the, you're the best mystery writer in the world. If you can convince every one of your readers that they're getting the solution five minutes before everyone else reading the book. As long as everyone thinks that, you're going to sell a lot of books. Uh, and I think this comedy bit has a bit of that same effect. So you break down super simple and the people are like, I know what a palindrome is, you know, and then they feel a little smug. And then you start dropping the palindromes and snub Dumbo Bob, mud buns. You know, that one's pretty, that has a good ring to it. Yeah, you get this thing on Twitter too, you know, people like to know they've got something. Yeah. So if you do a, with any sort of word game, if you just write it out and you don't explain it, sometimes that can be a good thing because then people get it and they say, ah, I got this so that they, yeah. they like well, the Well, I mean, you keep going down that path and pretty soon you're James Joyce, right? <laughs> you, you don't like Joyce, do you? I think he's fine. I, I think he's a little <laughs> needlessly uh, uh, difficult. I, I think the puzzling is a little overdone, but, you know, that's my personal taste. You know, I, a lot of people, I'm sure, feel the same way about palindromes. They're like, just give me a sentence that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. The good guy punched the bad guy. That's a good sentence. What's wrong with that sentence? I like that sentence. People get angry at palindromes quite a lot, I've noticed. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's that when they, when they can't, uh, for a lot of people, I think they read something and it doesn't quite make perfect sense as, as a sentence. Right. They, they can actually get quite frustrated by it and then want to lash out. <laughs> so, that works on, yeah, because it works on a second level. And the second level is the one that's more important. Well, I've got, I got, I was really angry for a while at the palindrome taco cat. Just because it's so popular, you know, and like, you know, you guys, like you work really hard in these palindromes. You come up with these original whatever. And then everybody loves taco cat. I'm like, it's just sitting there in the word and it doesn't make any sense and be like taco cat yeah I, I don't know whether you can see this in the dark these these are the socks i'm wearing today <laughs> <laughs> i'm wearing taco cat socks because oh, when i saw hilarious. them i had to buy them <laughs> and there's a band named taco cat and uh um one day, uh, there'll be, one day there'll be socks with one of my palindromic sonnets on them that's right yeah, it's high, but <laughs> right only size 12 or larger, because it'll be a long palindrome. <laughs> or, it's really hard to get super tiny letters on a sock, I think. <laughs> and quite and pointless. You're a print, you guys are printers. If anybody knows, it's you. <laughs> I guess you do the, the single thread. What do you call it? Uh, I want to say cloisonne. That's not the right word. But, you know, uh, 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 
single thread stitching to to draw the letters then you could make it as as tiny as you want <laughs> right instead of a a a, we, a woven pattern you could just do is that making any sense at all you know what i'm yeah, saying like, i think it ended up more expensive than the cassette tape oh so. yeah absolutely <laughs> there's no doubt about that <laughs> You get a free cassette tape, tape with it as soon as you get rid of them. <laughs> anyway, we, we need to get back on track again. Okay. Or well, do we? I don't know. I think but, that what we're talking about. Well, so so I, have, I have a thought. Mm -hmm. So we what are things so just because you can't hear that music is palindromic, that doesn't mean it doesn't have a distinctive quality. Is there a way that palindromic music sounds different? That isn't that doesn't necessarily read as reversible, but is still unique, because I find that in written palindromes. I think written palindromes have a rhythm. I, what I think of as kind of a chunky rhythm, that I can usually tell a palindrome in conversation if I overhear someone saying it, even though it's a, a visual thing. And maybe it's just because they don't follow the normal rhythms. Maybe it's just broken rhythm is what I'm hearing rather than a particular rhythm. But I feel like I, I I can hear palindromes. Is is there something like that with palindromic music? Even if you don't wouldn't know that it's palindromic. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure how to answer that. I I think it's probably there are probably different answer for different different types of music. Right. I mean, I don't think I don't think there's an exact parallel. Like what I was thinking of as you were saying that is, um, you know that. The difference in feel between a single letter palindrome versus a paired letter palindrome; right. those have a completely different feel to them. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, you know, not uh, not just comparing you know, like one example of each, but you know, like a large body of them, they they have a different feel, yeah, you know, a different vibe. Um, and I don't know that one could say that there is uh, that kind of distinction in in palindromic music, at least the examples that, that I am thinking of, often it's something that is there, uh, but it, it's it's not obvious. It, 12 tone music plays with the uh, inversions and retrograde inversions. But you can hear 12 tone music, right? I mean, it it has a distinctive sound, or does it? Oh, sure. It's so, a, yeah. but that, that comes from the chromaticism and other rules, really. It doesn't come from the, the palindromic uh, rules. Mm. Oh. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, uh, yeah, 12 tone music, uh, each of the 12 pitches um, are equally important as opposed to tonal music where you, you have a, a different kind of structural edifice. Uh, and in 12 tone music, you'll have d different tone rows, things like that, that will be manipulated in, in different ways. So so certainly there's a, a very different feel in, in 12 tone music uh, versus tonal music. and. Uh, that uh, some of the the famous twelve tone composers, especially Berg and Webern, write a lot of these retrograde palindromic structures. Mm. Uh, but again, c could I? Does it have a different feel from twelve tone music that's not using a palindromic structure? Right. I don't know. Yeah. So I think I think yeah. Laurie and I are both saying here we don't know. So. Okay. <laughs> <Could be. laughs> yeah. We think yeah. other other factors other factors are, are more distinctive than the reversibility. Whereas in literature, it's a distinctive quality. So, though some of our friends kind of have, like I think John Agee to a certain degree likes the idea that you could write a palindrome that's so smooth that people wouldn't even notice that it's a palindrome, right? Yeah. Like you, like my gonna... short example there, Yoda's sad. Oi, you could hear that. You wouldn't necessarily think that's a palindrome. Yeah, there aren't many over seven words long yeah yeah short ones in particular i think i think one of my favorites is no we fax a few on you know something that oh, could yeah. just be in in normal speech that you wouldn't well sort of normal no one really talks about faxing now but you know it's <laughs> it's <laughs> you know it's something um unremarkable right. it's um and i think there's something pleasing about that but yeah, there's no no striking significance to them, I, I well, guess. I think there's a real interplay between uh, the amount of work or the awkwardness of it and humor. So right. sometimes the ones that sound smooth can also sound somewhat dull. Uh, you know, the, the great exception is a man, a plan, a canal, Panama, which sounds like a political slogan that somebody could have 
written mm-hmm. and you wouldn't necessarily know that that's a palindrome uh but you know there's other ones like derek i like red okay it is a palindrome <laughs> it doesn't sound like a palindrome it's also not that interesting or funny <laughs> in any way you see all art is about these compromises and uh, for, for palindromes that's emphasized that you have to say okay if it's not going to have this quality it's got to have this quality so right. in a palindromic poem for example a, a lyrical palindromic poem it has to be very musical or full of imagery mm-hmm. because it's not going to make much sense so you're you're getting rid of meaning so it's got to have another quality to it yeah and yeah and like you say that could be humor yeah uh sometimes i love the ones that have what seem to me to be heroic efforts to make sense or, or like uh uh, like there's one of Howard Bergerson's I love that has heroic diction, which is, ah, Satan, no smug smirk rims gums on Natasha, which is just a way of saying she wasn't smiling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the lengths that he had to go to make that work, but it's a perfect English sentence. There's nothing, you know, but it's just a uh, very interesting uh, uh imagery uh yeah but but there's but the awkwardness is part of what i like about it so let, well let's get back to the history oh yeah you know the 12th century and 13th century is particularly the 13th century had a real explosion of palindromes and uh in two very localized places one was in england uh, and also Paris centered around the three universities, which cropped up in what, like late, late 12th, early 13th century, uh, Oxford and Cambridge uh, and um, uh, Paris. Uh, and then the other, for some reason, I haven't been able to figure out, there was a tremendous burst of palindromes in the Rhine, Val- Rhine River Valley between Basel uh, and Strasbourg. But also in the the Colmar is a little tiny town in there that had a, a a monastery, and they burst out like <laughs> this is hilarious. I found this thing so from the annals of the monks of Colmar, and again this is like very late 1200s, early 1300s, and they have some palindromes in Latin that are you know so so not incredible but fine, uh, and then. The guy keeps going and he he just seems to have had a nervous breakdown because in this very rare, the annals is just like, there's two lines that are palindromes, but it's just like, nee, 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 na, 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 on, 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 on. (laughs) (laughs) And I just picture this monk pulling an all-nighter with wild eyes. It's like, ah, more palindromes. We've all been there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I actually, I, I'm, I'm working on an article where I compile every Latin palindrome uh, written before the year 1600, uh, which is in verse. So I actually am uh, excluding the, the rota sator square because it's not in verse. And I think it's more of a word square than a, what the, Latin, what the uh, Romans called versus recurrentes, uh, which are verses, right? Versus. Um, and it's clearly not a verse. So, but anyway, I'm compiling all of these, and, and I had to put in a footnote saying there was also this palindrome. Na 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 ni 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 ni. I think the reader will understand why I'm not including this in the corpus of recorded Latin palindromes. <laughs> I'm numbering them all. There's about 45 I've got up through 1600, and then it it went absolutely insane. There's another one that's interesting in Strasbourg. A guy named Gottfried von Haugen, who is a minor uh, a cleric, a canon there, and he wrote uh, some songs uh, and and some um, a, a long poem to the Virgin Mary that was part of a, you know was adopted as part of a thing. Pretty obscure guy. I didn't know you could do this. He was turned down for his church job, which included a regular annual pay, and he sued and won a lawsuit against the church for not giving him the job so in in like in 1300 so that was kind of an interesting twist but so he wrote his book only one copy of the book was ever made and it was kept in Strasbourg 
And then around 1860, it was blown up in a war, in the Franco-Prussian War. And so you think, oh, my God, it's all, it's all lost forever. But no, because six years before it was blown up, a French guy wrote an article about it and made a handwritten copy of most but not all of the book, but leaving out part of the palindromic part. And then do some <laughs> more research, and it turns out in the 1400s, a student had copied a big chunk of the palindromic part in his notebook, which filled with doodles and probably dirty pictures and whatever, you know, but it was preserved somewhere as a manuscript. And so there's a German scholar named Volker Schupp, who's a Germanist at the University of Freiburg, again, right in there in the Rhine River Valley, who put these things together and his life work has been recreating Gottfried von Haugen's original text, which was lost to war. But he's like 88 now. And so I just like two years ago, I, I always Google looking for new discoveries and stuff. And I find a manuscript that he put on like academia.edu or something not even formally peer reviewed. And it had the saddest introduction in it, which when I was able to translate it from German was just like, I was delayed in my studies for many years and now I'm an old man and I'm not feeling well and I don't know if I'll be able to get this properly done. So I'm putting out what I've got so far in the hopes that somewhere out in the universe, someone will be able to pick up this work and continue my life struggle. And I'm like, that's me. I'm that guy <laughs> who found this. Google me. Palindrome. <laughs> but it was the saddest thing. And then, you know, COVID hit and I was really busy. We moved. My wife got this job and stuff. And I didn't get around to writing the guy. I'm like, oh, God, he's got to be dead for sure now. And I finally emailed him and I got a reply back in German. And he offered some criticism. I have a, um, a friend who's also an older retired uh, classicist. Uh, William Burke, who used to teach at Stanford, and a uh, great friend of mine, great guy, and he's been doing all of my translations for me, and so he did some of the translations of the Latin palindromes, and I sent them on to Volker Schupp, and he was like, good, good, oh, not sure about this word right here, and then the two of them had a dialogue going back and, and uh, corrected stuff, so I was really happy that I was able to get in touch with the guy, but you know, when the pandemic hit, uh, the sense of mortality that came through with that. And then I read this manuscript. He's like, my whole life's work is about to be lost as I die in obscurity in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so sad. And, you know, and then his whole life's work is about this guy who lived in the 1290s and wrote the one book that no one else ever copied or probably cared about um so maybe it's, people you know, just aren't that interested in palindromes i guess <laughs> we not. need to well, accept it you know there's fashions and whatever and things wax and wane and apparently it was quite the fashionable thing in the 1200s but then maybe in the 1300s people were like oh not palindromes again lord this... about the anagrams this year yeah right <laughs> <laughs> rebuses or what's he you call it rebuses you know where you have the pictures and the words mixed together like there's a picture of a b and then a plus sign do you have those do you yeah, know what i'm talking yeah. about i think we, we call them dingbats don't we you might <laughs> i'm sure they're just being known as dingbats I, I might be making that up or maybe but, that's yeah. the people who care about them that you're referring <laughs> to we, we had a, a local cheap beer here. Oh, not here. I moved. I keep forgetting. I live in Vermont now. I used to live in Portland, Oregon, and the cheapest local beer uh, had rebuses on their beer caps. And they were really bad rebuses. So you really needed to be down about a six pack before they started to make sense. And recently, my friend Lou, when I moved, my friend Lou gave me a present. He had saved a tub of these beer caps. So the next time we get together in person, I'll bring a few of these beer caps for you with the really bad rebuses that don't quite work. I don't know if the person doing them had a strange <laughs> accent because they are phonetic, right? So your accent would matter a great deal. 
Yeah. Yes. I keep getting off track here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Should we? Uh, should if we, we return get... to track, that's kind of a palindrome, though, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. Do, do we want to start talking about like Bletchley Park and? Oh, we've, oh yeah. we've got so, we've got before that we've got the the very first English. Oh yes, yes, conference. yes. Ben Johnson uh, was is the person who first used the word palindrome. Right. Right. In in. Uh, in his book called Execration Upon Vulcan. But the odd thing is that he was mocking them and uh, he hated palindromes and other forms of wordplay. Yeah, and many it, do. It, but he, he invented the word just to mock it, which is the strange part. And, and so he is, is, you know the story? His study had burned down and he wrote this poem yelling at the god of fire for burning his study and saying, why me? Why did you pick on me? It's not like I was writing stupid palindromes and anagrams and chronograms. Then it would have been fine if you burned it down. I would have deserved it. I totally would have deserved it. But I wasn't doing that, was I? That was sort of the gist of his poem. But it turns out it was actually quite a fad in the early 1600s. And I think a lot of other writers had used the word palindroma in continental books and he just changed the ending to an e so he probably gets too much credit anyway for uh for for doing that but uh you know john taylor the water poet great english hero he's uh they call him the water poet he was a a, a boatsman uh on the thames river and he was actually I, I, I imagine, you know, like gondoliers with a long pole. I don't know exactly how it worked, but they're basically ferry operators and they were considered hard drinking, rough, you know, guys likely to cut you in a knife fight in a tavern or something like that. And he actually would ferry people to Shakespeare's plays down the Thames from London and back. Uh, and he could make some money, but it was, you know, it's like a taxi driver, basically, would be the modern equivalent if people are old enough to remember taxis or like an Uber driver, but Uber drivers are more casual. It's more like, you know, uh, 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 the great Martin Scorsese movie, uh, Taxi Driver, uh, you know, so that kind of thing. And so, but he was a poet. So, uh, and he, he's a very modern figure. He pretty much invented crowdfunding. So he would do these stunt books and self-publish them. And uh, he would actually raise subscriptions. So he did a book where he said, I'm going to walk to Scotland. So everybody give me a little bit of money and then I'm going to walk to Scotland and write a book about it and I'll give you the book. Uh, uh, and, and then I'll sell the book. And this was a way of getting publicity as well as uh, obviously just raising money to do his stunts. So he did a lot of stuff like that. And he was kind of mocked by people. He didn't speak Latin, um, uh, but he wrote the first English palindromes. And uh, most people are familiar the one, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, lewd did I live and evil I did dwell, or you can reverse it with the ampersand in the middle. That was one of only three that he wrote at the time because it was written to the queen who I guess her given name was Reed. And so it was written in his book, Dear Madam Reed, Deem If I Mead, which I don't know exactly, you know, uh, uh, please accept this if you think it's okay. Something to that effect. Um, so Dear, and he wrote it D-E-E-R, Madam Reed. So there, it was actually the third palindrome, Lou Did I Live and Evil Did I dwell but the weird thing is no one wrote another palindrome for 225 years perhaps, this perhaps because those are so bad <laughs> <laughs> well loot did i live is is not that bad i think I, you know for the first one in a language it's you know it makes more sense in the rota square doesn't it that's true <laughs> but cha changing um, the spelling just to well there wasn't changing swelling though spelling wasn't fixed at that time there was a wide range of acceptable spellings in English. So I don't think any of his spellings were considered wrong. Well, they, uh, and it should have been easier for, for, for the people. <laughs> right? Who... Well, that's what I'm saying. You know, and, and, and there were, I can show you a dozen magazine articles where people go, there are many palindromes in English and they list palindromic words, but nobody ever puts them together into sentences. Meanwhile, you know, 
Latin palindromes are exploding. French, German, people are writing palindromes all over the place. It must have just not been the fashion. It was considered uncool by, you know, John Donne and all the, you know, Ben Johnson and all the cool kids mocked it or whatever. Um, but it's kind of amazing that no one, even some obscure figure did this. But we, we don't know another palindrome until the United States in uh, Baltimore in a newspaper in roughly 1840, 1844. And it was clearly derivative of, of that because it's snug and raw was I ere I saw guns in war. And it had two ampersands, just like the blue did I live and evil did I dwell. And it even, the, the person who wrote, wrote this article about them, <clears throat> he just says it's a newspaper man from Baltimore. And then he says he, he's unhappy because of the ampersands. So he kept working on it. And then he came up with the famous Abel was I ere I saw Elba, which is only the fifth English palindrome ever written, but to 1840. Uh, now, the interesting thing about this is that uh, the most famous Baltimore newspaper man was Edgar Allan Poe, who is known to have written palindromic puzzles and published them in his magazine at the same time there. So possibly Edgar Allan Poe wrote these or undoubtedly it's someone he knew who was hanging out and talking yeah. about palindromes and, and doing, he had the kind of thing, you know, that people love those kind of riddles, you know, um, uh, I, I, I'm never to blame and my first and my last is always the same. They would always have rhyming clues like that, you know, and it would yeah. be Anna. And Poe is Poe is the inventor of the, the modern detective story. Yeah. So and detective stories often have uh, these. Well, anagrams are more common, I suppose. But right. You often right. get these little word games going on as clues. Right. Yeah. Um, so I I think it's entirely possible it was either him or or certainly someone in his circle who had had discussions about this. So yeah, that was that was the one Poe published was a series of those kind of answers and then you take the first letter of each one and it spells another palindromic word going the other way. I don't find them that amusing, but it was probably hot stuff at the time. But then there was this explosion of palindromes, mostly in the United States, I think, and often in children's magazines, which are incredibly literate. Um, I, I, I have a friend named Ovi Michelson who wrote a book called... Uh, word, I don't know, it's a wordplay book that's out there that you can find. And he's done a ton of research on uh, the late 1800s, uh, th th things that were sent to children that were more literate than most adult American magazines <laughs> today, <laughs> talking about famous authors and wordplay. And, uh, and, and several of them were pioneered at that point. And then a group called the National Puzzlers League that started putting out uh, uh, the Enigma which is there it's to this day, Will Shorts has, has kept it alive um, and putting out a bunch of little puzzles. And a lot of times the answers would be palindromes. So that's a lot of the early palindromes came through there. Um, and then some, I, again, Britain is mysteriously quiet through this whole time period until Lay Mercer until, until. pops up. Yeah, but apparently, but some of it, we just may not have documented it and you or maybe me, the next time I get over there, can do the research. Apparently, there were newspaper contests where people did palindromes. This would be late 19th. So uh, early 1900s, I think, like 1930s, maybe 1940s. Uh, There's a great okay, so story. It's just before, just before Bletchley. Right, exactly. And, and after, continuing into the 50s, I think. There was, so Leigh Mercer uh, and... Uh, I, I guess I should go back and tell the story. So Bletchley Park had a palindrome contest because apparently it was in the air. <clears throat> and you know they recruited the Bletchley Park people in part because of their skill at crosswords, which was this incredible fad. And this is something listeners might not know. There were every different kind of wordplay was popular. Anagrams, transposing letters, what they call beheadments, where you chop letters off the top. And crosswords came out in what about 1919 1920 and just wiped every other kind of wordplay off the board and just 
pretty much everything else dried up and everyone was just crazy about crosswords. When they recruited people to crack the Nazi codes at Bletchley Park, they looked for, cross, for skill at crosswords as well as speaking German and mathematical ability and that sort of thing, because so much of it is having partial information and working out the full letter. Uh, and as it turned out, their method was very prone, it was very similar to the way you construct palindromes. So the thing that I find fascinating is, you know, they had these machines such as the Enigma and then later the Tunny, and they had these rotating wheels and they would, uh, um, they would, um, every letter would rotate to do a different letter, but there's obviously still some kind of pattern between them uh, that you could work out. Well, it was almost uncrackable unless you do two separate messages with the same code. Because it, there's this, I don't, I'm not a mathematician, I don't know exactly how this works, but so there's the layer of the, you know, the, you're basically matching two alphabets into a telegraphic code. So do, uh, I should back up a little bit. You know the telegraphic code, the Bado system. So it was converting letters into a series of dots. They're binary dots. Um, and in fact, computers were invented pretty much to break these codes. The reason we're all doing binary was like five binary dots, yes or no, and you could construct the letters of the alphabet with a few left over. They used the left over for things like end of sentence or stop transmission or whatever. And so uh, they have this unique quality where you can add two letters and get a third letter that's always the same. And you can subtract letters from other letters. So like, you know, you have your five bits. So a yes here minus a yes here equals a no in, a, in each of the five bits. So you can just say like A plus X is always this letter. And, and Z minus Q is always this letter. So you, right? So you have two layers of meaning. So when, you use the same code to encode two different messages. You can layer them on top of each other and the code cancels out. It's like the code disappears mathematically. I don't really understand it, but it works and it's magic. And the code breakers didn't need to understand it. They just needed to know that it works. So every now and then the Russians would mess up and like, I mean the Germans, and start their transmission and go, oops, damn it. I did it wrong. And then they would go again, but with the same, they, they wouldn't reset all the codes because that was a huge production to do that. So they would grab these, they called them depths when you have two things on the code. And now you knock out the code twice and all you're left with is two different sets of text and the letters are mixed. And if you can separate those letters, then uh, you can work it out. And it's a consistent pattern throughout. So then, Germans are very organized, right? So they would often use the same words at the start. They would go begin transmission. So, okay, well, we know the first few words. It's begin transmission. And you knock out the second lever. And it had the great quality of if you thought you knew a solution, you could test it and it either worked or it didn't. So you knew right away if it worked or it didn't. So they could go through letter by letter and uh, you'd get a certain number. So like begin transmission and then you find the other code. And then you can strip that out. And now you've got a few letters left over, just like when you're writing a palindrome. So I'm not explaining it very well, but the way it worked out was as you went along, you would get something you know is true and then three or four letters. And then you could kind of guess what the next word is going to be. So yeah, the next so word. I see. It's like building outwards the way yeah, you build out to the L-A-N. Yeah. And then, so uh, maybe that's the word long zom, sad. So I could try long zom and I would know instantly if that works or not. And then in the other one, I have some letters left over there because the words don't end on the same letter on each side. So it's exactly like when you're doing palindromes and you're adding on to the ends and you have a few letters. Okay, I've got this word here, virago, and now I've got, oh, something O-G-A. What, you know, okay, well, A can be a separate letter. It's got to end in O-G, log, bog, dog, you know, how, how you build palindromes that way. It's pretty much the exact same skill breaking these codes, except you're trying to guess what the word is in this text string. 
So I'm sorry, it feels very long-winded and unclear, but it, it's almost identical. So they had a palindrome writing contest and they started out uh, uh, Henry Whitehead, a great mathematician related to Alfred North Whitehead was in charge of the whole thing. And uh, Peter Hilton was a very young, like 18, 19 year old mathematician assigned to this. And he had an unbelievable ability to visualize letters in his head. And he could see how we were talking about adding the two letters. He could just in his mind, try out different combinations. Okay, well, I see a Z that could be an X and an L, or it could be an H and a D. And he could like pull them apart in his mind and see what the result would be. Uh, so he didn't actually even use pen and paper. So they had this palindrome competition started out. Henry Winehead goes, sex at noon taxes. Yes. That was like the first big hit in the thing. And, uh, and he goes, I think we can do better. Let's push on. So they do this palindrome competition. Peter Hilton lies down on his bed with the lights off, no pen, no paper, and constructs a very long, brilliant palindrome just using his mental visual ability. And you probably know the palindrome, but I'll say it for the benefit of listeners. Doc, note, a fast never prevents a fatness. I diet on cod which is not only a brilliant palindrome, but excellent dietary advice decades ahead of its time. <laughs> like people in the United States only figured out to stop binge diets like in the 80s and 90s, right? Uh, just like starvation diets. He's way so, ahead of it. So there's that sacred truth again. That yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I think, you know, that I think there's something to that. It certainly adds power to the result. Do we know if Alan Turing wrote any? We don't know. The thing is, the secrecy of Bletchley Park was so astounding. We didn't know any of these palindromes. The Doc Note palindrome didn't come out until the 1980s, I want to say. Maybe late 70s, early 90s, somewhere in that stretch. And it only came out from the brother of one of the mathematicians. Donald Mitchie was a mathematician there. And his brother, I forget his first name, was a, a British wit, poet, whatever. And he entered the competition with the palindrome that his brother had told him 40 or 50 years earlier and sworn him to secrecy. And he's like, well, 50 years ago, by I can't do any harm now. Uh, and he won the competition and then, you know, uh, uh, Howard Bergerson, my mentor, the great palindromist, wrote him a letter and he said, uh, you know, tell me about writing that palindrome. He's like, I didn't write it. And uh, I got it from my brother and he didn't write it either. But his brother was one of the Bletchley Park code breakers. And then not until well into the 1990s did Peter Hilton publicly confess that he was the one who wrote the palindrome. But by that point, most of these guys are long dead. And uh, everybody's memory is a little shaky. So other than sex at noon taxes, that's the only other palindrome that anyone is on the record as saying came out of that same competition. But Lay Mercer, who the great British palindromist, um, best known for a man of plan of canal Panama, published 100 palindromes in Notes and Queries magazine starting just after the war ended, I believe 1946 through 1953, uh, in batches. He was very careful to say, I did not write all of these palindromes. I collect a lot of them. And we've seen some of the ones in his list I found in the United States in the 1920s in magazines and that sort of thing. So there's some reason to believe that. But the, I strongly suggest that a lot of these may have come from Bletchley Park. And the connection is, Lay Mercer lived very close to Bletchley Park and he was an itinerant engineer and machine repair man. Exactly the sort of person who would have been called into Bletchley Park on a very hush-hush basis to, uh, you know, to repair some machines and perhaps have a chat with people and palindrome certainly might have come up if it was in the air. He died, I believe, in the 1960s, long before anyone had gone public about this stuff. I mean, there are people at Bletchley Park who died in the 1980s and 90s who never told their wives what they did during the war. 
That's how secret this place was. It, it, uh, the cover story was that it was a radio factory or something yeah. like that, radio repair factory. So uh, sadly, uh, the veil of history is kind of closed about some of that stuff. But Mercer also had a real uh, thing about not taking credit for palindromes. There was a funny story about this. So uh, Leigh Mercer entered one of these newspaper contests in Britain, and he's poor. He, he's not a guy who ever had any money. Jay Linden never had much money either. Uh, nor did Howard Bergeson, for that matter. Hmm. Nor did it's, it's, a, it's a boring <laughs> pattern. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's very sad. But uh, so he entered a competition and he would have won, but uh, J.A. Linden was the judge and he got a letter under an anonymous name and he rejected it, he said, because I know that's one of Leigh Mercer's palindromes. And it was actually Lay Mercer himself who sent it in. And would have won the money, but he rejected it for plagiarism because he was like the only man on earth who would have known this palindrome because he was a friend of <laughs> Leigh Mercer's. So his coyness about authorship cost him dearly. So, well, let's let's talk about the Palindromist magazine then. OK, you started that in the 80s. No, like 93, 94, somewhere in around then. It's part of the zine scene. Were you guys into the zine scene at all? I, I was. I was a punk rocker. So yeah, I, and, and, and you're now culture. a printer, so it seemed like the odds were pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I first got into zines from a band I saw in Portland. I was doing a public access TV uh, indie rock and punk show called Wasted Talent. And I saw this band called Girl Trouble, which is a great roots rock band out of the Pacific Northwest. And during the show, they threw their zines at the audience. And I'm like, what is going on? They're throwing paper at us. And we picked it up, and it was a super fun zine. Uh, people who remember the 80s will appreciate. The cover I saw was like, uh, who is cooler, Debbie Gibson or Tiffany? <laughs> <laughs> Battle of the Babes or something like that. Um, <laughs> two pop singers of, of the era. And uh, uh, and it was just so fun and fresh and different. And I started getting obsessed with zines. And as you remember, in those days, you'd have addresses in the back. You would send away for other ones. And then I started reviewing zines for a magazine called Fact Sheet 5 in the United States, uh, which was the Bible of zines. They would literally review anything anyone sent them. You could scroll something in blood on a rock and mail it to them, and they would they would review it. And I was doing their literary zines at the time. And then I got my palindrome obsession. And Miriam and Seth, the people running it, were like, when are you going to write a zine? You're casting judgment on everybody else. And, you know, seemed like the obvious way to go. So, uh, yeah, it seems yeah. so weird these days. It seems so uh, like such a challenge to start something like that and get people interested in it and find yeah. people to be involved with it. Because these right. days just go on Twitter or... And, and yet, and yet, I, uh, zines are back. Zines are very hip with young people. There's a Portland as a zine resource center that opened up. And, you know, I'm three times the age of anyone else there. But it's, uh, it's a very <laughs> happening thing. Uh, and I think there's something, the tangibility of it matters. Like everything on the web, your website could disappear tomorrow. And who's to say it was ever there? other than maybe internet archive, you know, and now people aren't even doing their own websites. They're not even blogging anymore. They just have a, like a Facebook page. Facebook could go out of business tomorrow. Um, I, I don't know. I, the, the, the thing I always liked about zines, and it certainly worked out for me because here we are, is they seem really good about building community. And I just don't see the same effect from online discussions. For, yeah, for whatever there's, reason. There's a good parallel here with poetry. The, oh. You, you, may, you may have heard that poetry doesn't sell very well. Yes. And I can confirm that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so it would be quite easy these days, it'd be quite easy to just do everything as PDFs. Right. Put them up for free. People can donate money if they want, but just make them free. Right. And do it that way. And, and to some extent, that is a very good thing to do. But it's also important to have that physical product. Right. That actually means something and that and you're saying we've made 
the, we've gone to the effort to make this because yes. we believe in it. And I think perhaps that that's true of zines as well. Well, and on a good day, it's beautiful, which your guys work certainly is. You know, I, when was the last time you ever saw a web page? You go, that was beautiful. Wow. That really made my day. That was special. That Facebook page that I clicked on, it, yeah. it really <laughs> warmed my heart. <laughs> no, that's just, it's not a thing. Um, and, uh, but uh, the, yeah, the, the, the tangibility. And then the other thing is the gatekeeping. You know, I think what when it's so cheap to print online, anybody can print anything and and they do. And it's terrible. Most of everything is terrible. And, and really, the value of printing is what you don't print. Mm. It's setting the bar for this is the good stuff. And uh, you can print that on Facebook, but you know the stuff i'm going to go to the trouble of buying paper and affixing ink to that paper you know it, it, there's a higher bar there yeah definitely uh, we now have a cat involved in the podcast yes. 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 <laughs> this is zeno he likes paradoxes <laughs> he's lovely one zeno <laughs> that's that's why he's named zeno <laughs> He heard us talking about be... zines and and misunderstood. <laughs> yeah, that's what you were calling him. <laughs> He's not going to bother your dog, there, is he? No, she's lying on the floor. They're very close. <laughs> They're about an inch or two apart. So the yeah. the palindromist then. So you, you had to go and find people. Yeah. Uh, so how did you meet? How, well, how did you meet Laurie? Example, well, you two uh, knew each other before I knew years. You. I think it was when we were recruiting for the World Palindrome Championship that that I actually met uh, you. Or is it just emailed before that? Before yeah, that, yeah. It was um, I think you. It was right around the time you started the semis. Right, right. So well, that was have... about the time of the first World Palindrome Championship. Oh, yeah. Um, just explain what the semis are. Yeah, it's it's the Oscars of palindromes, and it's also the answer to. All the people who, sorry, but I find somewhat annoying, the half clever people who say, why isn't the word palindrome a palindrome? <laughs> I don't know. Why doesn't the word shit smell bad? Because words are representations. <laughs> They're not the thing they actually are. <laughs> Do I have to explain this? The word green is not green. It's printed in whatever color you want to print it. It's, it's an abstraction. It's a metaphor. Uh, it's a label. But... Um, but then again, semis is a palindrome. So, uh, and I didn't come up with it. It was invented by Hugo Cortius, uh, who also printed under the name Battist. Do you know him? The really irascible, interesting Dutch author who died a few years ago. Someone's working on an auto, uh, not an auto, on a biography, which I'm really looking forward to seeing. Anyway, he wrote this incredible book called Simmies which is the most multilingual book I've ever seen in my life. Every page has maybe eight or nine languages on it. Uh, it will have a whole series of palindromes in every different language with very erudite scholarly discussion of one of them uh, and some graphics beautifully printed. Uh, it's a fantastic book. If you don't have it, you should rush out and try to find one. You might have to go to a rare books website or something. Uh, um, but anyway, so simmies, but, and of course the singular of simmies is Emmy, Emmy, right. A single award is Y M M Y because it wouldn't be palindromic <laughs> if you said one simmy, would it? So, uh, one of them is an Emmy and then, uh, the awards or any group of them, which were, and you guys both win groups of these awards, uh, are simmies. Uh, and so we get a bunch of celebrity judges every year who vote on the best new palindromes, and then we we publish the results. That came out of the the first World Palindrome Championship. Uh, do we have time for that story? Yeah, of course. Because you, okay. you arrange that. This is one of the many things you've done for. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, let me just back up before it gets lost in my tale of personal pissiness. Um, the thing that I've loved about this more than anything 
<laughs> is the the community that is built up around the scene. It's not a huge community. We're not going to claim there's a thousand people riding palindromes on Earth, but a large percentage of the people who are writing palindromes, we all email together and, and go, oh, I got a new one, or John Agee's great about this, and go, what about tombstones? We can do tombstones, you right. know? And then <laughs> something that gives you a bit of context so that even, you know, marginal palindromes might work, and you could do something that makes sense. And starting, um, with, uh, starting with the same, well, starting and ending with a certain yeah. phrase, and we all have to try and fill yeah, in them. Yeah, right, right, the famous, uh, Eva, can I in a can? Um, that, that's, I think, the, the one I keep coming back to. Eva, can I stack Rod's sad ass dork cats in a can? That just made me laugh so cave. hard, my brothers cave. and friends. Okay, what's mom. that? Okay. In a cave? What did I say? A can? Oh, my God. <laughs> Eva, can I stack Rod's sad ass dork cats in a cave? Thank you. <laughs> Can't believe I said that. Um, yes. But, you know, it's fun to have the community of people where you say, Eva, can I? And everyone knows where it's going to end up in that darn cave. Um, in, it's a journey uh, that matters then. Yeah, right. It's the journey that matters in that case. Um, so the community. I mean, that's ultimately what it boils down for me. And all these other things are outgrowths of the committee. The World Palindrome Championships, the Simis, the magazine itself. Uh, and hopefully when we travel again, uh, we can get around and visit each other in person or uh, I don't know if we should talk about it publicly, but Anthony and I have some notions for something that might happen at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. That would be a place to gather people together and get new people involved to come in and join us, uh, perhaps literally as part of the show. I think that's something we could possibly do. Uh, so uh, the, the World Palindrome Championship started. Uh, because of this guy, Barry Duncan. Were you around for the Barry Duncan stuff, Lori? Uh, yes. <laughs> this guy who suddenly anointed himself the world's first master palindromist around 2010, 2011. It got a ridiculous amount of press coverage for this. And I'm like, Vladimir Nabokov wrote palindromes. <laughs> Lewis Carroll wrote palindromes. Possibly Edgar Allan Poe wrote palindromes. But you, sir, are the first master the first. polymerist. <laughs> and the master, just the arrogance of it. I mean, you know, I mean, we tend to be a bookish sort. I think it's fair to say polydermist. I, I think it's fair to say I'm the loudest mouth of all the polydermists <laughs> out there, but that's not really saying much. But yeah, I just got offended by this guy posturing. Oh, God, it was just horrible. So anyway... Uh, I was uh, communicating with Will Shorts of the New York Times and the, the Puzzle Master from NPR, who has been a subscriber to the Palindromist from day one. Uh, very great supporter, uh, wonderful guy. And I was complaining to him like I am to you very much right now. And Will has always loved palindromes. He's always loved competition. So sure enough, he said, well, there's one way to settle this, isn't there? <laughs> Let's have a showdown. And uh, so we came up with the idea for the World Palindrome Championship, live competition, uh, get three constraints that we don't know in advance from Will. We have an hour to write palindromes. And it's, it's based on a comedy show called Iron Comic by Nato Green, a San Francisco comedian, which is in turn based on Iron Chef, the TV show, where chefs show up and you're given weird ingredients and you have to combine them into some kind of meal. And so there it was. Barry Duncan was hedging about where he's going to come up. He brought a documentary filmmaker with him who was like, really? Imagine cheap. doing that. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, anyway, Barry came in last, dead last, eight out of eight in the competition, and no one has ever seen any of that footage. And when some documentary filmmakers came along to film the second one, he refused to share any of his footage with them. I was trying to convince him. I mean, we've seen this before where two people do very similar films that come out at the same time. It's great publicity for both of them because that's publicity gold for any film mm. to have two, two simultaneous releases on the same subject. So, um, Mark, yeah. Mark, who did win the first one? Uh... <laughs> I can't remember. He's really good looking. 
Uh, <laughs> I, I actually wrote two palindromes that were pretty good, and I wasn't sure which one to pick. And I had uh, uh, a friend of my dad's was there supporting me, a great uh, newspaper journalist. He actually won a Pulitzer Prize at one point, Jack Rosenthal. So it meant a lot to me to have him there. There's like 600 people there, right? Um, and uh, it was great to have a friendly face. And I had written these two palindromes. One was the one that won, which was uh, uh, Devil K fixes trapeze part, sex if yak lived. And I should add that the, the constraint was to use an X and a Z, or a Z as we call it, uh, in your palindrome. And I threw in a Y just to show off. Uh, but the other one I thought was a better palindrome, which was about someone famous in the news. And uh, it was uh, the president of the United States was Barack Obama at the time. So I wrote, um, I tan, I mole. In a way, Obama, I am a boy, a wan Illuminati. Yeah, that's better. Which I think is a much better palindrome. And it's one that, you know, when we were talking earlier, you could read that and maybe not even notice that it's a palindrome. It'd be a little weird, but um, uh, I had one guy who is not a palindromist criticize me and go, oh, if it's only one, it should be Illuminatus. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> Write your own damn palindrome. Everybody's a critic. Um, Jack said, I said, which one? This one's better. Cut. That one's funnier. You can still be an idiot. Get the sex yak. Everybody's going to vote for the sex yak. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's 2012. Yeah. Well, we're all looking forward to the London Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> and you're, you've just been crowned the world, world yeah. champion. Right. Champion. Right. Yeah. Okay, so what happens next? Uh, well, then next we have the semis um, because we wanted to make an annual thing. So Will Schwartz is in charge of the World Palindrome Championship. And at this point, we don't know what his plans are going forward. We've done two, uh, and it's up to him, or unless he gets tired of it, then he might turn it over to us and we can run our own uh, competition. But in the meantime, uh, I decided we should have an annual thing because he likes to do them about every five years, which I think is a good stretch of time. I mean, let's face it, there's not that much public interest in Palindrome. So I think an annual competition might burn people out. Um, also, it's it's on the spur of the moment. So I thought it would be good to have something to celebrate all the great new palindromes that are written every year, like the Academy Awards, the Oscars of Palindromy. So hence the Simmies um, from the Battis book that I like so much, and because it is the same backwards and forwards. So uh, I went about recruiting a bunch of celebrity judges. We really overachieved the first year. We had Weird Al Yankovic, uh, uh, Dimitri Martin, the comedian who had done a palindromic show at Edinburgh, as a matter of fact, uh, American comedian Jackie Cation, um, uh, a bunch of other big names, um, and uh, what I didn't tell people is they weren't going to be there. <laughs> I just emailed the list of nominees to them and they just voted for their favorite. And that's, I mean, there's no budget for any of this stuff. And um, so I did it at a comedy show in Portland after the main part of the show. And we had a, uh, you know, we had a brief announcement and read the palindromes and people clapped. It's only ever been a live show twice. The rest of the years, it's it's just been uh, virtual that we put it out. But again, I think this gets back to the, the problem of the modern age is there's no gatekeeping. There's no one to tell you what's good or to draw any distinctions between quality. And not only are a lot of people not good at weeding through thousands of choices and finding what the best ones are, a lot of people don't care. They're not. They don't want to do the work. They just just show me what the best ones are. I, you know, why should everyone have to reinvent the wheel? Um, and uh, so there's. A, I think there's a value to these kind of uh, awards, and it's good to get some recognition for the people who work so hard and uh, and submit them. And we've had, I think, a new winner every year. We we get a lot of interesting new blood coming into the competition. Um, Malachi Stahl this last year and you know uh, so it's great to see that there is uh, uh, new energy coming in and 
um, you know, uh, Lori, uh, you know, you got in touch with us right around 2012, right? And quickly, first, sort of the way it works, first you join the email group, if you're good enough. Uh, and then we let you in on the discussions and or you just submit your final work to the semis. The judges tell us if, you know, how that all works out. Um, and so that's been going on every year. And then we had the second World Palindrome Championship in 2017, this time in Stamford. Connecticut, not uh, Brooklyn. That's where Will Schwartz does his American Crossword Puzzle Tournament most years. And that's what this, uh, the World Palindrome Championship both times so far has been a part of, of Will, Will's uh, American Crossword Puzzle Tournament as seen in the movie Wordplay. Uh, and- uh, yeah. So this is, well, this is when we met. Yeah, uh, in the... person, but we had corresponded. Well, we corresponded very late on the World Palindrome Championship 2, WPC2 as it's known. This was already going ahead. When we were first in touch, this was already happening. You, you already right. had the film crew. Uh, actually, yeah, we should talk about that first. Yeah, so like I, I was living in Portland at the time and uh, I'm fairly reclusive. I don't really go out that much unless I have a gig. Uh, but I went to the pub right next door to watch a basketball game and I hear this guy trying to impress a young lady saying, uh, oh, I, uh, you know, I just did this film about the World Tetris Championship. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, I turn around. Oh, really? That's interesting. I just won the World Palindrome Championship. And he's like, oh, really? He tells the story differently. He tells the story that I was trying to impress somebody. Uh, I'm a happily married man. That's not true. Um, and I'm an old man. I'm not really that interested in impressing <laughs> young people in a bar with my palindrome thing. But uh, yeah, Vince and Adam. Adam lives in Portland. Adam Cornelius, Vince Clementi from Los Angeles, who did, they did their, uh, what did they call it? Ecstasy of Order, I think was the name of their, their film about the Tetris championships. And they're very involved in setting up the, the Tetris champion. I mean, they, they, fit, they actually organize those uh, championships. So they were basically in on the esports thing very early. Esports is like a huge industry now. Uh, and I don't think Tetris is really the money making end of it, but they were in on that, that whole world very quickly. And, uh, yeah, so they're like, oh, well, you know, sounds like a good topic for our next film. I'm like, fine by me. <laughs> I have a lot of offers for Hollywood movies these days, but uh, I like yours. I think I'll accept it. <laughs> we knew at this point, as soon as Barry Duncan lost, we knew that first film was never going to come out. So the first contact we had was November 2016. Oh, that late. I'm surprised. It was that late. I think, well, Nick Montford yeah. couldn't make him. From MIT. Yeah. So you had to find someone else to throw in at the last minute. to. But I was also thrilled to get someone from the UK because, you know, it's the land of Leigh Mercer and J.A. Linden and John Taylor, the water poet. Yeah, um, and, and apart from Martin. Right. All American. So it's the world of the World Pond Gem Championship didn't quite look it right. It could use a little expansion. <laughs> Anybody listening to this, tell your friends. We should be able to get somebody from Spain, I would think. And Mexico. Yeah. Big palindrome culture in Mexico. So mm. the question would be, should we open it up so they can submit palindromes in a different language? Or are we just going to ask them to, to write in English? Well, that's up to you. Yeah, well, so it could be a bit or tricky. Will, if Will's running it next time, it's up to Will. So, yeah, November 2016. I'm pretty sure it was November. Okay. Uh, you asked me if I wanted to go and do this. Yeah. And you hadn't won any simmies before that. No, we. I hadn't. I didn't know the simmies existed. I'm existed. surprised because you fairly well dominate them <laughs> since then. <laughs> we we'd had no contact at all, and I, I, did, uh? I didn't know that there was this. I, I'd never heard of Palindromist magazine as well. What? Was How was that possible? Did someone good? <laughs> Come on, but then once I found out, I was I was very happy to uh, hear of it and to watch oh, the short film. Yeah, and so and then of course I I joined your email 
Yeah. And then I got to go to New York for the first time. How was that? It's oh, we, we loved we loved it. Oh, it's yeah, it was fucking cold. It was. <laughs> it was yeah. March, but there'd been some really unseasonably cold weather. Yeah. Uh, it was basically this time of year, but it had been really, really. We'd had we'd had snow in the UK, and I think there'd been massive snowfall over there, and yeah. It I'm was, living in Vermont now. It's hard to to be terribly <laughs> sympathetic. <laughs> we, but yeah, it was it was very cold. But it was really nice weather, though. It was like really cold and clear weather. Yeah, great, yeah. great for sightseeing. It was great because the first the first morning we went to the top of uh, Thirty Rockefeller. Oh, and we, we were jet lagged, just... so we were like the first people there. <laughs> yeah, we'd woken up really early, right. so it's about eight we were waiting we for it to open. <laughs> right, and it was completely clear, so you could just see everything. Wow, that's so, great. Well, that was amazing, and that was yeah. So we were in. America for five days, which was silly because it just meant we were jet lagged the whole time. All right. But, but it was fun. New York was fun for a couple of days. And then we went to Stamford. Yeah. Which, is where, a, which normally is a boring suburb no one would ever go to. But not when the American Crossroad Championships. No, no. that Everything changes. Everything changes then. I'm just saying it's not New Orleans. You know, it's... <laughs> It's a it's a functional place, isn't it? Yes, exactly, exactly. It's a business place. Yeah, it's not New York. I mean, but that's, we had to leave New York to go there, and we thought, what, what are we doing? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. The Thunder Championship. <laughs> the first well, one was in otherwise. Brooklyn, which was nice. I did like that. So we arrived in Stamford, jet lagged and drunk, and got more jet lagged and got drunker, <laughs> <laughs> and and had to do had to do interviews and try to. Look oh, even right. slightly not jet lags and even slightly sober, <laughs> and just had the best time. It was mm. oh good. This is actually something we should focus on because we talked about community a minute ago. Yeah, um, it's strange you can get a group of eight people together like that and they all get on. Yeah, you know there was no mm. conflict and they're never well, they're never Barry really. Has Duncan been. wasn't invited, so yeah. I think would I be right in saying that most of you guys had met before? in the flesh anyway uh that's a good question uh well you know uh, many of us had been at the first world palindrome championship but had not met in the flesh before that that, that was the thing that was interesting about the first one was we've had so much discussion with these folks virtually but had never i, I had met john agee back the first issue of my zine i met him at specs pub in san francisco which is a fantastic pub if you ever go out there in North Beach across from Vesuvio's hidden in a little alley. Anyway, just a great old time beatnik dive. And and that was super fun. But I'm not sure I had met a single other person in the group before then. Uh, Martin and I traveled around California for a couple weeks afterwards. Had I met you, Lori, before this last one? No, I hadn't met any of you until the the second championship. Yeah, I mean, we are pretty widely dispersed. It's just uh, A.G. and I happened to live in the same city when I first met him, so that made it pretty easy. Back to the World Championship. Yes. Okay. Which uh, none of us won, although Laurie came extremely close. Could Literally could not have been closer. I mean, <laughs> mathematically, there is no way you could have lost by less. Lori, I think it was like <laughs> one third of one point because there were two nights that had differential values and it was a single <laughs> point on the first night which had the lower value was the yeah, only it was separation. It was complicated. But it, it was insane how close that was. But you had you had the most popular single palindrome. Right. Does, is that any consolation? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so what was the palindrome? Well, uh, one of the constraints for the second night uh, was to write a palindrome about Donald Trump. So, you know, that's awfully easy to do um, in terms of getting a laugh. Um, and in a crowd with a, a large popular vote going for humor, um, it, you know, it seemed awfully easy to do. Uh, so the palindrome, well, Trump, of course, uh, before he was 
kicked off Twitter recently. It was a beautiful moment. Um, but, uh, you know, <laughs> he at, at a certain point in his presidency, he, all of his tweets were just completely ridiculous and h- horrific. And but he would end them uh, with, you know, many of them were in all caps and they would end with sad uh you know, the failing New York Times, sad, you know, just all these just absurd, just invective, you know, of course, you're, you're, we're all unfortunately familiar. Um, so uh, I ended the, the palindrome with sad. I, I began it with uh, dastard, dastard stuns. I nodded, nah, little handed Don is nuts, drat, sad. Uh, <laughs> So again, he was also always making up names to describe people based on physical features and, uh, um, you know, just constantly making fun of people in every possible possible way. So it was kind of taking the style of a a Donald Trump tweet and making fun of him. Yeah, because it's got the two things. It's got the sad, the the, the little handed, I think. I think people like that. Yeah. I think uh, uh, be, whether you use this or not, Lori, I think you do yourself a disservice by saying it was easy to come up with the Trump palindrome. Uh, that was ki- I didn't even try because his name is impossible. And I thought it was quite clever to come up with little handed Don. Uh, and then oh. the sad, everyone knew who you meant. <laughs> but, you know, I've never tried to use the actual word Trump in a palindrome. I don't think I might have done something weird with like text, text message abbreviations and PM or something like that. Um, But uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it just doesn't work. But Don, Don is very easy to to put in a palindrome. And, and just he was constantly, you know, giving appellations, you know, with with people's last names. Um, No, it was great. So it was, uh, Again, it was emulating uh, the ridiculous style of his tweets, uh, but making him the subject. So yeah, you, you got the tone just right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you could you could have just misspelled Trump, and it would have worked. You know, it right. does manage to. It didn't don't come third on the basis of the the misspelled Anakin. <laughs> oh yeah, the Star Wars uh, controversy. <laughs> I, I I think I was not even aware of that. Um, I don't. I didn't even recall that happening. Ooh, yeah. You look confused, Mark. Uh, I'm just not sure what we're talking about. Doug's palindrome about Star Wars. Oh, right. It had to. It did really well, but it had a spelling mistake in it, and right. nobody noticed. And uh, boy, nobody gets upset like Star Wars fans. You don't want to cross them. Yeah. <laughs> You mentioned Trump not being very palindromable, but one thing I have noticed, certainly from from what Anthony sort of tells me through the chat, and obviously Mark, your award winning first palindrome championship yes. palindrome, rude words palindrome quite easily, don't they? Yes. Or is it just the sense of humour of palindromists that sort of lends itself? I mean, we... it's both, isn't it? I think because <laughs> yeah. there are definitely you can't deny the fact that there are some words that do just. They work. Boob. Right. Boob. <laughs> well, and I think palindromes give you a bit of a license. Because it's difficult to write them, you can kind of pass it off like, oh, I had to. I didn't really have a choice. When, you know, I am a stand-up <laughs> comedian. One could infer that I might have chose to even if I did have a choice. But, you know, I mean, come on. You write a palindrome with uh, uh, the word, with the letter X in it. What other words do you think <laughs> with the X in it I'm going to use? Zbex? <laughs> Xeroxes? No, sex is definitely going to be in that palindrome. That was Will's choice, I think. It, again, with Sotati the obscene. He invented pornography. <laughs> <laughs> and, Surely you know, that and, can't be proven. <laughs> True. That's the the opinion of Strabo, the first century uh, writer. Uh, in, in the specific term was canadology, based on those dancers, the the canadoi, who uh, uh, Michael Fontaine, a professor of classics at Cornell, 
uh, refers to their dance as twerking, is his modern translation of the, the kind of thing they did. Or one more erudite scholar said, they waggle their buttocks up and down as if inviting company. <laughs> A lovely way to put it. <laughs> Yeah, there's some really horrible things written about Sotadis in the 19th century, I'm afraid to say largely by British scholars who were quite intemperate uh, at their uh, opinions of homosexuality. And uh, yeah, pretty, pretty uh, harsh and unfounded uh, assessments of someone for whom we only know 12 fragments of, of verse. Um, but yeah, uh, Victorians, yeah, they had some issues. I love the thing where they, they would they put on piano legs. They put little doilies around the ankles on piano legs so they wouldn't be too <laughs> erotic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you think uh, piano legs too uh, alluring, then <laughs> perhaps you're the one with the problem, not the piano. <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay, so the, we've nearly done the history of palindromes. We've got up to 2017. World Championship 2. Uh, and then, was it the year after? Two years after that, we did... We have to plug our own work here. Yep. Two years after that, we did a, an anthology called Reflections, which has all yeah. of us in it. Fantastic. With visual poetry, uh, symmetrical visual poetry, as well as, mm -hmm. as well as a range of different types of palindrome. Mm -hmm. So... There we are, we plugged that. Now, the future of palindromes. I'm guessing the book Slate Petals might have some palindromes in it as well. You know what? It does. <laughs> At least one. <laughs> <laughs> it has all my best, all the ones that uh, people like anyway. They're, they're, they're nice and short, Mark. You, you'll like Good. that. I, well, I, I'm not against long ones. I just think there's a the burden of proof is on the author. Same as with a long novel. If you've got a 500 page story to tell, tell it. But just don't pad a 200 yeah. page story into five. I'll say, I, th I think we're, we're kind of on the same page with this because yeah. I don't believe in doing long palindromes for the sake of a long palindrome. Right. But if I'm writing a palindromic sestina, it's, right. got, to it's got to have 39 lines. Sure. Because otherwise it's not. <laughs> not a sestina. Yeah. Right, right. So yeah, I, I I know that that I mean there are novels. I think it's two, two novels. Two novels. Yeah, two entire yeah. novels, fifty five thousand words. If they are in fact palindromic, has anyone checked? <laughs> My theory is that about thirty pages in, it just goes. You didn't really think this was a palindrome, were you? I wonder how many idiots bought this, believing that it was. I think you're saying that's your theory, implying you haven't read it. I haven't read it. Of course, I haven't read it. I own it. I may be the only man on earth who owns both of them, but uh, it's tedious beyond all belief. I got about a page and a half into each one, and there was no joy to be had. Yeah. Laurie, have you, have you read either of them? I have not. And for the audience, we are, of course, referring to Dr. Awkward and Olson and Oslo, and uh, on the one hand, and Satire Veritas. So has anyone read it? I'm not sure the authors <laughs> read it. Yeah. If we're if we're some of the people most interested in palindromes in the yes. world, and we haven't. Well, precisely my point. Mm. Well, I, I think it's like what you're saying. Um, there, there is a, certainly a place for long palindromes, and I like many long palindromes, but it they have to be very compelling. There has to be perhaps paired with some other formal structure that's going on or some right. sort of uh, thematic um, coherence. Um, I mean, I mean, it's it's not that difficult to write a, a long palindrome that isn't very good. It's right. very difficult to write a long palindrome that is good. Very difficult. I mean, you could you could just repeat a short palindrome any number of times, any odd number of times, and it's a palindrome. I could write "poop sir is poop" and repeat that eighteen thousand times and have the world's longest palindrome. But what would the point or, of doing or the that be? kind of a a lengthy list format? Uh, I mean, a list format can be terrific, actually, in in a certain uh, context. Right. But you know, like a computer generated list of just right. 
the man of on planet to, canal exactly, variations. Exactly. Right, that Dan kind of Hoey, thing. a Navy uh, programmer, came up with. And right. It's fine as a programming exercise. You guys probably know this, but every yeah. beginning computer programming class has checked to see if this is a palindrome is a mm -hmm. beginning exercise. Yeah, I can't, I can't program that even. I'm so bad at programming. <laughs> oh, I'll give you lessons the next time we get together. <laughs> Between shows at Edinburgh. Um, but, you know, I, I think a lot of what, what's happened, you know, uh, as Will puts it, we're living in a golden age of palindromes. But I think really pushing the limits and showing what's possible with palindromy and that it's not anything monolithic. I mean, there are all sorts of different types of palindromes, um, mm -hmm. palindromes for different occasions, uh, different lengths of palindromes, uh, different types of palindromes, uh, different aesthetic values um, for different types of palindromes, things like that, that there's not, uh, I think many of us all have our favorite types of palindromes. Uh, some, you know, John Agee, you know, he can't stand the long palindromes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he, he loves no, the short palindromes you know, and he wants them to be visual. Yeah. But his first palindrome is actually pretty long. Go hang a salami on a lasagna hog. That's, I wouldn't call that a short palindrome. That seems really? pretty short. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> not sure. <laughs> well, I I think it's interesting when we've talked and and you know over email, just you know what do we value in a palindrome and what will we not do? You know, there are always compromises you're making in writing a palindrome, and and we all have our different kind of. Well, I don't like to do that, or I don't like to do this, or. I find this is well, this is fine as long as I can get this in return. You know, right? There's there's always a balance. Yeah, so I love what you're saying about longer palindromes. If the, if it's going to be long, there has to be something else to it, as mm -hmm. we've both said. And then I said earlier as well, if if uh, a palindrome doesn't mean anything, then right. it better be beautiful or musical or right. have mm -hmm. something else mm -hmm. to it. Like any other kind of writing. Yeah, I mean, my bottom line is it should be fun to read. Hmm. I think poetry is 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 perhaps the the biggest open frontier right now because it you know the added structure and the 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 things that we all love about poetry give you a reason to keep reading and and justify a longer format. But well, I like to think so. I mean, I, I you know I've seen those lists, computer generated lists that go you know a man, a clan, a dog, a pat, a pan. I mean, they're not fun to read. It, it's impressive in a way. But there's no joy to be had, you know. Uh, I, I, I think we should apply the same standards to palindromes as we do to any other kind of literature. It should be funny, or like you say, or it should be beautiful, or it should be rhythmic, or intellectually or, stimulating in some way. Yeah, yeah, compelling. Why hmm. is your palindrome compelling? I, I have a question for you guys then, because I think anyone. Who's, who's listened this long certainly might be interested. Um, this long, <laughs> if they're not hospitalised. If, if this is this is like the, the thing at the end, uh, I guess it might not be exactly the end. Anyone who's still awake. Yep. Yeah. You Leading all write years. very different styles of palindromes. I know this because I know you at Reggie, um, but you all play with the same tricks and things like that. I guess in turn. How do you go about creating your palindromes? And, and do you have any tips for anyone who might be thinking of having a go? So I don't know who to start with. Shall I go Mark first? Uh, I've been trying to defer, but OK. Uh, I, you know, the standard advice is to start in the center and look for something. Look for a phrase, could be a word, but more likely these days a phrase, because I think individual words have been pretty well explored. Uh, that has something else in it backwards. So, I mean, you're going to need to develop the skill to read letters backwards in any case. So just start looking at words backwards and you will discover some words that have other words in them backwards. So to take the example of Peter Hilton's classic doc note, I dissent, fast never prevents a fatness, I died on cod. The key was the word prevent. Look at the word prevent. You should not have trouble seeing the word never in it going backwards and there's only one letter separating it from the beginning so you can put it together and say never prevent that's a phrase now that is with an extra t at the beginning 
that you've got the beginnings of a palindrome. The T is a good thing. I think the worst thing to start with is something that's already a palindrome, like say not yeah. on, right? Because then your possibilities are infinite, which is horrible. That's crippling. <laughs> <laughs> you want as limited possibilities as possible for you to work your ingenuity on. So T never prevent is great because now I need a word that ends in a T. And so, you know, and then build from there. And then you're going to have words left over on the other side, letters left over on the other side, and then build off those. And then at a certain point, you got to finish it off uh, or they get too long and rambly. But I mean, I think that's the gist of it. Those and those words are great. And there aren't that many. But when you get a word where you've, you've essentially got uh, another word in the middle, such that you just have one letter either side. Right. Like, never prevent. Yeah. Legacy, legacy cage. Uh, ah. Well, I'm so cosmic is a good phrase. With right. The, I'm and so you've got a C cosmic. at the beginning. And the C at the end. Yeah. Yeah. It was even that hit song. I'm so cosmic. You already know I'm in the. No. Okay. Is that one of yours? <laughs> <laughs> There's a rapper in the United States. Laurie, anything to add? Um, yeah, I guess for me, uh, a lot of times uh, a certain word will spark my interest. I, you know, I might see a word somewhere when something I'm reading and just think, well, this, this is a very interesting word. Um, or sometimes I'm trying to write something about something that's, you know, has some sort of theme and, and I'll compile a, a list of words that have palindromic potential that would fit this theme and then just start playing around to see see what happens. Um, I don't always start in the center. Uh, oftentimes, again, it's I'll start with a specific word and it may end in, it could be at any point in the palindrome. Uh, but yeah, just you just start looking at words backwards, essentially, and, and you go from there. I've got another. Oh. Uh, for people who are just starting, it's very easy to think just in terms of nouns, verbs, adjectives. Don't forget your conjunctions and prepositions. Uh, uh, Mark mentioned earlier, and I'm, I'm going to insult this palindrome of yours that you wrote when you're eight. Please. Uh, radar, kayak, <laughs> radar. That could be radar as a kayak, as a radar, which isn't much better, but. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's just adding these, don't, you know, don't forget about the indefinite article. Don't forget about on, no. That's quite Absolutely. Easy. Or oh, is yeah. it? There's a lot you can do with those, and it also makes them sound much more natural. Yeah, and right. people forget to do that when they first start writing palindromes. So, I, I think, I think that's good advice. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and, and how do you all feel about? Um, I don't know the right term here, but maybe the un non letters. Like I'm thinking the ampersand mm. as a get out, maybe. As, as something to use to help expand your vocabulary or I know Anthony you've written with the thorn which is thorn, an old fashioned yeah. letter that, that is th um, right. it's like a y you see it in ye old pub it should be the the, the old pub um, how, how do you all feel about that shall I start go on yes it's good when it's an intentional usage it's don't do it just to make your life easier. Okay. Agreed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I have a couple thoughts on that. One is, of course, punctuation is generally considered free. You can do whatever you want with it. The ampersand is an edge case, and that's, that's pretty controversial, going back to the first English palindrome. But generally, yeah. I, you know, as you'll recall from my article, The Seven Useless Arts of the Palindromist, which was in the magazine, <laughs> punctuation is one of those key skills that you can rescue a palindrome with. Or often I see people's palindromes that would be improved with better punctuation, that they read kind of awkwardly now and work those semicolons and parentheses and, you know, uh, you're on the knife's edge of meeting and you need every bit of help you can get. Uh, the other thought I have more generally is that I think almost every palindrome has flaws in it. And it's your taste in flaws that defines who you are as a palindromist and, and also what you accept. Like if you ever want to drive Martin Clear mad, uh, <laughs> use OH 
uh, or O, like for oh, OH, Anthony, <laughs> right? When it's not an address in a poetic opening to a sentence, like that just drives him up the wall. But other people, are like, oh, that's fine. Uh, I would never use abbreviations. You know, I, yeah. I just think that's horrid. I don't even like to use names if I can help it. I, I generally no, I speaking, more than one name, I think, is a real mark of weakness. But again, uh, but that's like I said me. about using the thorn or the ampersand with names. If the idea is you're writing about a certain subject, yes, exactly. then you actually is the opposite. You want to get as many names right, relating right. to that subject into it. That's well, it would challenge. have been a real mistake for Lori in the World Palindrome Championship not to use a name in her poem about Trump, I think. Oh, right, exactly. It was a, a thematic kind of <laughs> Actually, <laughs> the necessity. requirement. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I avoid using names unless they have um, a, a purpose, a thematic purpose to the to the palindrome. So but I guess one thing I wanted to say in terms of, you know, the future of palindromes and, you know, it's this incredibly extreme constraint. And, you know, I think... Uh, in any kind of writing, there there are always constraints, just many times they're unacknowledged. Um, and by actually acknowledging and focusing and doing these extreme constraints, I think you can 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 really push push what is possible. I mean, when you when you you write a palindrome, as we were talking earlier, uh, you end up with word combinations that one would never think of if it were not for this type of constraint, or especially if it's paired with other constraints too. I mean, when I've when combining constraints, then I'll come up with with combinations. Again, I would never have thought of using uh, if I had just simply been writing a palindrome. I would have gone, you know, you're always choosing. It's it's this exercise in combinatoriality assessment, you know, <laughs> and picking and choosing and manipulating the the combinations. And I would have gone for something much more logical or easier. And and then I would have missed this kind of really interesting phrase that that came out of the the interplay of multiple constraints and i i think that there's a lot to be said with with constraint based writing where the the constraints are are acknowledged um absolutely well i, I bet you're gonna agree with that anthony yeah it's funny because half the time i find myself trying to hide the constraint right and the other, and the other half of the time i i'm trying to sh show that the structure is as important, if not more important, than the content. So mm -hmm. I, I, it's kind of there are two there are two me's here. But right. <laughs> I, am I there trying to write a poem that's that reads like a normal poem, and and there's you would barely notice the practice of palindrome, or am I really saying, look, I'm drawing attention to this. It's a palindrome, and it it does these other things. Right. So and both approaches are are valid. Right. Yeah, I think yeah. I what I meant was you know you should. In the creation of it, you are you are working with constraints versus saying that you are writing out of free inspiration, you know, oh, that yeah. sort of thing, a an acknowledgement in the, the kind of creation of it. And yeah, I think that's uh, some of the real magic uh, of palindromes is reading something that is just this, you know, incredible crystalline kind of com complex structure and yet also has this incredible flow to it. and that one wouldn't necessarily identify as there's something wrong with it. <laughs> mm, <yeah. laughs> you know? Well, I find as a writer myself, I like the fact that the constraint forces me to let go of control to a certain degree and look in the language for inspiration and not like I am the genius master controlling the universe through my words. You know, it's like, I'm more like, the analogy I like is I'm like an explorer in the mountains trying to find a pass through high peaks in an unexplored area. Uh, and so, you know, there's some ingenuity to it, but it's really a sense of discovery and like pushing yourself to an extreme place and go, oh, look at that. That's awesome. That opens up through that cleft. It didn't look like you could get through there. Yeah, it's like you're, you're co-authoring it with the language itself. You know, uh -huh. again, it's as much writing as discovery, even though there's a lot of creativity and manipulation happening. Yeah, we talked on this podcast before with a couple of people about constraints in general, and we come back to this idea, you're collaborating with an alien. That's <laughs> oh, yeah, that's great, that's great. That sounds familiar now. <laughs> <laughs> 
so yeah there's there, there is a big future for this art form uh, on a more practical level there will be a world championship three i assume sure I hope think. so i mean it's kind of up to will but uh last i heard he was going to think on it and get it back to us and i think practically the the realistic possibilities are he's going to do the third one at the 2022 american crossword puzzle tournament as he's done before and or he's going to say you know what you guys take it and run with it uh and at that point we'll we'll have some possibilities i i would be open to you know the question is where would we do it and how would we build up a crowd i think about doing it at edinburgh honestly i think yeah. you could get a good crowd there yeah <laughs> mark laurie we've covered over two thousand years of palindromes in less than a thousand <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> it's so good to see both of you again and to talk to you about this uh this thing we love and yeah so thank you very much uh thanks so much for having us on it was a joy and i look forward to seeing you all in person i can't wait to do part two this was wonderful <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much To discover more, visit us at pentrackpress.com. 